Hello, I'm Darren Means and this is Indiana's Obsession. I wanted to do this documentary for three reasons. First, I wanted to show the rich history of Indiana high school boys basketball. Second, I wanted to combine my love of filmmaking with my love of basketball into one project. And third, I wanted to show that high school basketball is still a viable way to bring together communities, families, friends, and have competitors in one common goal, and that is to share this experience of Indiana high school basketball. Dr. James Naismith invented the game of basketball at a YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts, 1891. Um, it was a game that he was trying to come up with for the boys in the wintertime. They were very rough, used to football, and he wanted a game that wasn't as rough. So he asked the janitor to get a couple of boxes from the basement. The janitor only found peach baskets, so he nailed these peach baskets up to either end of the uh, gym, and the boys were supposed to shoot into the baskets. Um, they were not allowed to dribble at first, they can only pass. And every time they scored a goal, they had to get it up out of the basket. He wanted it to be kind of a more passive game, but still with skill involved. Of course, the boys kind of ran wild with it, so he had to make some rules, and he had 13 original rules. In 1893, Reverend Nicholas McKay, a student of Dr. Naismith's, brought basketball to Crawfordsville, Indiana YMCA. He hired two local blacksmiths to forge an iron hoop for each end of the railings, and then they sewed coffee sacks and put them for the nets. Indiana was a perfect breeding ground for basketball. They had small communities, mostly farming, and they needed something to do between the harvest and the springtime. Basketball was made for indoors, it was made for small groups and small communities, and you were able to practice it yourself. Without the chance meeting between McKay and Naismith, we would not have the basketball madness that we have today. With the innovations of McKay and the basketball crazy state of Indiana, an Indiana institution got underway. March 6, 1894, Crawfordsville played Lafayette at their YMCA. It was the first basketball game in Indiana. It was held at a second story gym in Crawfordsville, and that's now a parking lot for a bank, uh, the sites where the first official intercollegiate ball game was played. In 1911, the first state tournament was held, and it was by invitation only, given by the IU Booster Club in Bloomington. The 13 congressional districts were invited to send their best team, Indianapolis did not send a team that year because they could not declare a best. Crawfordsville won the first state title over rival Lebanon 24-17. I think I can mention three or four differences. First, we played our games in 20-minute halves. There wasn't any dribbling. The footwork at that time wasn't perfected like it is now. We played a four-man offense and a four-man defense. We played what we call a floating center. We had a back guard, a man who never passed the center of the floor except to intercept the ball. In 1912, the IHSA took over the state tournament. And they didn't recognize the first champs until 1957. Lebanon won that first state tournament over Franklin 51-11. 1913 and 1914 was the first time that all of the teams played in the state tournament. And it was the first small school team, Wingate, that won back-to-back -back tournaments behind the play of their towering six-foot-three center, Homer Stonebreaker. Stonebreaker was a star in college and early professional basketball as well, and he was a charter member of the first class into the Basketball Hall of Fame here in Indiana. Wingate was known as the Gymless Wonders until their second state title, when the town decided to build a livery stable-type barn that had two pot-bellied stoves that the boys could play basketball in. It was also the site of the first electric scoreboard built by two local electricians in 1934. Tiny Thorntown won in 1915. One of the schools we didn't, didn't have a, an out-of-bounds on the one end, and the players could climb that wall and throw the ball down through the basket. And we went to another place where one side of the gymnasium was a wall, no out-of-bounds, and half of it was chicken wire. And the players on that home team would throw the ball against the wall and run down on the other side and pick it off and go on and score the basket.
Lafayette Jefferson won in 1916, and it was the first large school to win the state title. They also won one in 1948 and 1964 under the Hall of Fame coach Marion Crawley. 32 seconds. How long can Lafayette hold the ball? They still have it in backcourt. This is Brady with the ball with 24 seconds remaining. Gives to Stillabauer. Stillabauer is guarded closely. The throw out to uh, Walkie. Walkie throws underneath. Alone. Looking up and hitting. Right, here we go for the free toss. 58 to 55. Five seconds remaining. The free one is off the mark. No good. First four seconds. Two seconds. One second. That's it. Lafayette wins it. 58 to 55. This is a great story here when Frankfurt High School won four state championships. And their famed coach was Everett Case. And Everett Case coached high school basketball in Indiana for 17 years. Then he went to North Carolina State University. Took tons of Indiana boys down there to play for him and lit up the state of North Carolina for basketball. He is an icon in that state, and they credit him as being the person that brought big time basketball to the state of North Carolina. Of course, we all know what it is down there now, Duke and North Carolina and North Carolina State. North Carolina State and North Carolina are located real close together with a highway connecting the two university towns. And Coach Case, he bought a cemetery plot that was located right next to that highway and left it in his will that the North Carolina State bus, team bus, should go past there every time they're going over to play North Carolina. He would raise up and wave to them and wish them good luck on their trip over. The North Carolina people have told me there's a new highway today, but the team bus still goes down the old highway to go past Coach and Case's grave. In 1917 and 1918, Lebanon became the first school to win three state titles. They also later had Hall of Fame coach Jim Rosenstill and one of the greatest shooters ever, Rick Mount. Everybody loved to play basketball, they, everybody got along well, and it was a team that was just gelling. And when we came out of the World Max Valley Tournament uh, undefeated at that point, we said we, we think that we could go all the way with a few breaks. And I think that going all the way, you have to have the breaks as you go. And uh, we won 30 straight ball games and came coming into the uh, semifinal against Marion. Uh, that was our 31st uh, straight win. <laughs> Okay, Martin, and it could go pretty far. It can reach all the way to the top row, home center. 
So if I point somebody out, let's see if you can hit them. We'll try it. Okay. Go. Oh, that's pretty darn close, dude. Everybody that's ever played the game of basketball has kind of a story to tell. Um, they could tell you in great length about how they became obsessed at an early age. And my personal obsession started with my uncle Eddie. Um, he was a huge University of Kentucky Wildcats basketball fan. And that's kind of an anomaly in this Hoosier Boilermaker rich area. Um, so I'm not a Hoosier basketball fan. but I did become a major fan of Indiana high school basketball at a very early age. My indoctrination into this religion of ball came from going with my father and watching our local team, the Crothersville Tigers, play in the huge Seymour sectional. If we didn't make one of the games during the sectional, my dad would record it on an 8-track and we would listen back and kind of uh, relive the games. When I was young, my grandfather uh, built a basketball uh, court in the backyard of my uh, parents' home. He built a uh, backboard uh, from work, bought a goal and a basketball, and gave it to me for Christmas. And I started playing. We put it on the highest building we had, which was a smokehouse. Maybe we got it up eight and a half, nine feet. My father was a basketball coach back in the 50s and the early 60s in small schools across Indiana. And I used to travel with him when I was even before school age. What got me started in basketball was my older brother and the guys in the neighborhood. And it, and it quickly became a passion. About everybody in Coleman, that's all they did when they was growing up as kids was play basketball. Well, obviously, I uh, started playing the game at a very young age, uh, you know, five, six years old at a local boys club, uh, you know, things of that nature. My father was a, was a sports nut and I, from a little town in Hope, Indiana. I think he always wanted to be a coach, so he, he wasn't able to do that and get an education. I think he wanted me to, to, to be a coach, and I, I followed those uh, requests. And uh... From the time I can really remember anything, uh, I had a little basketball uniform and basketballs around the house. And uh, My father was the head basketball coach at Mitchell High School, and I had an older brother that uh, ran around with the team. and. He kind of got me into it at uh, about age two or three, I think. My father uh, coached and taught at Carmel High School for several years. Every garage had a basketball hoop. Uh, the fathers had probably played. So uh, when you were a little kid, uh, you, your dad had been a high school player in that town, and he wanted you to, to get uh, proficient enough in basketball so that you could play uh, for your high school team. No, oh, I was raised in a little little town uh, called Sweetser, Indiana. I played for a consolidation in that area called Oak Hill. When I was in grade school, and uh, I had set my mind to that, I said one day maybe I'll be able to play in the high school tournament. My brother Bill is eight or nine years older than I am, and my parents built him a basketball goal, and uh, so. That's how I pretty much spent my days. When you're a little person, you look up and see other big guys doing something, and you want to do that. So as a big person myself, you realize there are little people watching you, so you want to make a set a good example. It was pretty easy to gravitate toward basketball, especially living in the state of Indiana, and especially around my community. We had a little basketball court called the Dust Bowl. And uh, the reason we call it the Dust Bowl is because we actually played on, on the ground. And uh, so we played every single day. I had two older brothers. Uh, one of them, uh, Andy, uh, Junior Boozy, uh, was about 10 years older than me. And my other brother, Rex, is two years older. And uh, we always played together. And uh, I think that's what helped me become a good player. I played with a couple of kids. That we were just all kind of poor kids. And one really poor kid was Johnny Wilson, a jumping Johnny who later known for. Uh, my stepbrother, I, 
I think was probably the driving force in that, wanting to go down to the local grade school, uh, Vogel Grade School in, uh, in Evansville, and play basketball on the weekends. And in those days, that was a hotbed of uh, one-on-one, two-on-two, and three-on-three basketball uh, in the city. And just about anybody that played ball anywhere came to Vogel Grade School. Well, I grew up in a time when uh, everybody, uh, every young man, uh, kind of cut his teeth on basketball. They grew up dreaming about uh, playing for their hometown, uh, particularly, I think, in the small towns. I still remember picking up a basketball and playing outside my backyard, in his backyard at about, uh, you know, around five years old, and pretty much never stopped then, and he was a high school player. When I was seven years old, uh, East Coast Washington won their first state championship in 1960, and. I think that's when uh, the, the, the fever started with me. Dad uh, got me into it when I was about six years old. Uh, he, uh, he didn't put me on a 10-foot basket and a big basketball where I'd pick up a lot of bad habits. He liked uh, cashew peanuts in a little blue peanut can, and he cut the bottom out of that and gave me a tennis ball and nailed it on the back porch, nailed it up on the back porch, and I shot on that for a long time. You know, Mom and Dad just gave me an opportunity. I uh, always had an opportunity to have a basket and a ball, and it was just something that I enjoyed doing as a kid. I shot a lot with uh, gloves on and dribbled the ball a lot with gloves on, which probably now is one of the techniques I use sometimes for kids. I, I was just a kid doing it to keep warm. I'm one of the prototypical kids who would clean the driveway off in the snow and go out and shoot baskets, and I, I would run a lamp out the window and so it could have lights, uh, light out in the driveway, all of those kinds of things that you have. And we used to have a wire that, that ran from the house to the garage on the left side, and so I would, I, I may, a move I had was to go as hard as I could to the left and drop a jumper over the wire and, you know, won a lot of games, won a lot of championships out in the driveway, but uh, that, I don't think that's an atypical story, frankly. I started probably when I was probably seven years old, and my brother Bernie used to take me all the time to the Sandlot over at School 67, which was the uh, junior high school that I, that I attended, and he gave me the opportunity to play with a lot of his friends. Yeah, I don't know, it just uh, kind of happened. I think growing up in Indiana, uh, you kind of gravitate towards uh, basketball. And it just became a, a sport that, you know, easily to fall in love with and then just continue to play with, you know, kids in your neighborhood and continue to just kind of work on things on your own. It just grew to be a part of your life. And I grew up in a small school in Northern Indiana, Deedsville High School, and uh, probably the highlight of all the year was when basketball season would come and you'd get to go see the county tournament with 16 teams. I came from a small town from Madison and basketball and baseball was the only thing uh, uh, we did in Madison. And I always say that uh, you know my father gave me an opportunity. It was two inches long and made of steel and that was a key to the gym. And I always used that key to get in and let my buddies in and play all the time. So I had a, a next door neighbor by the name of Bill Stecker that uh, lived really next to a barn uh, with a basketball goal on it, and he took the time to show me how to handle the ball, hold the ball, and and uh, the proper shooting techniques. Quite honestly, I tell a lot of people, the only thing I can remember besides wanting to be a basketball coach was that I wanted to be a, a cowboy, and I soon left that about the fifth grade. Dad fixed up a, a, a basket on the uh, wall of a barn door uh, we could play out there. We didn't have regular basketball. Her mother made a basketball out of uh, socks and drink and uh, scraps of paper, uh, scraps of paper and, and other rags to make it as round as possible. What is known as the region, the northwest part of the state has a long history of great players and great teams, but the schools have often considered themselves overlooked by the rest of the state, and this is given way to a huge chip on their shoulder, um, kind of giving them something to prove. Even though this area seems to be a little brother of the Chicago area, basketball is still a great part of this community um, in schools like Gary, East Chicago, Merrillville, Valparaiso. It's produced many greats such as Johnny Barato, Greg Popovich, uh, Pete Turgovic, Dan Dockich, um, Glenn Robinson, more recently, Tuan Moore, Scott Martin, Robbie Hummel, uh, Glenn Robinson's son, 
Brings it this side to Leonard Taylor. Taylor, a one-hander, gets it for the championship for different teams. That's Greg Allen. Leonard Taylor playing for Shortridge tonight is the younger brother of former Washington star Ralph Taylor, who played for that championship team in 1965. He can give him the biggest lead of the ball game with this charity toss. McPherson does it. Harry Roosevelt is the state champion of the state of Indiana for 1968. Put on a show. Tommy's already started tonight. And he takes the pass from Daryl Woods and goes right to the hoop and bingo. He knocks that ball right down through there and gets Brad Hostetter out. Teams weren't shooting well, which percentage-wise they weren't. The pace of the game was very slow, which it was, and they maintained the lead. Good, solid offense. Now they got a little trouble now, although Hostetter breaks around his man, gets the ball down inside. Shot is blocked. Out of bounds off the fingertips. Opera ball. Yeah, Robinson almost had a possession right there and knocked away from him. And we'll take a timeout. Two to just score. 339 to go in the first half. Robinson just turned 6 3 for Burbeth. A little trouble with it. There's a the ball deflected. Floyd saved. And a good block by Allen. Good ball movement. Robinson. As you take a look at 22, Carlos Floyd shooting from outside and scoring. The other. Behind the back, Allen Henderson inside, scores. I don't know if they'll count the basket or not. Yes, they are. They're down by 18 right now, and they're going to go down by some more if this basket goes in. It does not. It goes to five. And the celebrating has begun with 45 seconds to go. Uh, 2002 uh, was the year that we uh, won the state championship. Uh, it was a great experience, a uh, great team. We uh, first team to do it in my school history. Uh, brought a lot of camaraderie to the city, brought the fans out. And then the game itself was just a great atmosphere. We had fun, and uh, I was glad to be a part of it. Win or lose, I was just glad to be a part of it. Probably the greatest moment of my life. And, uh, you know, uh, any coach that coaches in Indiana, that's... Uh, the top of the hill. If you can win a state championship, uh, uh, you've made it. I shed a few tears that night. I was very disappointed. I think uh, a lot of people were disappointed. Uh, we, we went through that whole season. The closest anyone had come to us was 18 points. Uh, the regulars played uh, less than three quarters the entire season. We were beating teams that bad. Uh, I think, again, it was just overconfidence, and, and uh, East Chicago played an excellent game. In my own mind, I was wondering what kind of crowd would come back to the town. We ended up going from the neighboring town up the bridge, and when you come down the bridge, you're in our town, and it was just loaded. Three cars deep on each side of the road, people cheering. It was not only our town, but it looked like the entire region of Indiana was there. The biggest lead Roosevelt's had. Shepard's shot is no good. Artis to Gary, good. 74-58, Roosevelt, 27 seconds left. It's their ball game. Ball stolen by Gavin Gary. Shot no good, goaltending's gonna be called. Goaltending called on Odom. Shepard from out back, good. 13 baskets for Bill Shepard. Eight seconds left, 76-60. Ball to Shepard, shoots again, good. 76-62, it's all over. Turgovich, 15-footer, he's got it. Off to Lefebvre, Lefebvre underneath the Macon, puts it up and in. Turgovich shoots it up and in. Stoddard starts to drive, can't get in, beats Bailey. Back to Stoddard, left-handed, hook is good. Underwood's got it for Elkar. Feeds Macon. Underneath to Babcock, it's in. Stoddard looks for Turgovich, gets it to him, turns, puts it up, it's good. Babcock from the side. No good. Tipped up and brought off there by Bridgman. Bridgman holds. Eight seconds. Seven. Six. Five. Long pass, Turgovic. Knocked away. One second. Puts it up. It is good. The basket counts. And the ball game is over.
It's tough and fall. 42 to 41. And it goes in on this side a long pass. 28 seconds. 27. The time is going shorter. 25 seconds. Everybody's on their feet here at Butler Field House. 21 seconds. 20. 19. 42 to 41 is the score. Central and South Bend by one point. 15 seconds. Now 14. 13. And the ball is intercepted. And intercepted again by Central and South Bend. And traveling is called with seven seconds to go in the ball game. Five, five seconds. Five, four. Three. Two. One. The ball is in. No good. And the champion feeling because I felt uh, there that the team was capable of winning and and they did win and I think this uh, type of thing was instilled within uh, them ranked at the beginning of the season with AP and they're ranked number 18 for the coaches they got a pretty man to man right here Clay did start their big lineup tonight oh there's Cornell now foul trouble also in the game and they had to go to work and put him on the bench there's the three deep in the right corner leading up a state championship Nice look inside, and once again, that not only against a good player, but his size differential. No three he's a three right there. By Valparaiso, they have no numbers on the break, but they go to the hoop anyway. What a great miss. Through three quarters in this game, they turned it over only a total of 18 in the afternoon. And look who's on. Kind of treading in that water. Well, they changed their steinmetz there. They have Cornell on. So 4.45 to go in the game. Cornell up, yes. Not to go that away. Coronel now was double teamed deep in the right corner in front of the clay bench. Inside the nail, a nice turnaround move. 61 Valparaiso. Pull up shot, right side. Well, that this ball game. They've got to hustle and got to fire the three. Tough defense by Drew. Outside. It's on the way. It is gone. This section highlights the great high school basketball coaches from Indiana, many of which have permanently changed the landscape of basketball in this world. But I think the one big difference between um, Indiana high school coaches from the very biggest schools to the very smallest schools and everybody in between and the other states is that uh, there is no difference in Indiana. They're all top notch. I mean, you live it, you breathe it, you eat it, you sleep it. Since I was maybe 10 years old, I wanted to be a high school basketball coach. That was, that was my dream in life was to... To be a high school basketball coach, my parents used to take my brother and me out to games all the time. In Indiana, the coaches do a good job of getting kids in the gym, especially in the summer, and working on their individual skills. And then when the season comes along, incorporating those in the team. And that's that's something that's missing, I think, in other states. Because you know, if if you're recruiting, if you're a college coach and recruiting an Indiana kid, that the kid's probably going to be a pretty good shooter. The coaches in Indiana have been unique in their ability to hybrid all of the different defenses that are out there and the hybrid a little bit the uh, offensive styles that they've they've had um, uh, Ward Lambert, uh, coach Lambert and Purdue he often said the team that makes the most mistakes will probably win now he didn't mean that just as it sounds he meant the doer makes mistakes and he wants you to be active and have initiative and not be afraid to fail because we're all imperfect and we aren't going to fail on occasions Every case that coached in Indiana, they went to, before we went to uh, to North Carolina State. I know uh, one year uh, he looked at my schedule and he said, said, John, you need to go and take some literature, some English, some uh, history, and uh, were extra courses. And so I told my counselor, and she told me, it's a dull son, why are you on that stuff? Because I'm going to college. He said, no, you don't need to go to college. You need to go out to General Motors and get you a good job. At that time, the only job was a janitor job. And he said, she came down to him and said, Mr. Cummings, what are we going to do? He said, John wants to take literature, he wants to take sport history. He said, he may, not, he may fail, he may not be able to play basketball. So the coach said, if he fails, he just won't play. Marvin Wood, obviously, at Milan, was a great coach. Marion Crawley was such a great uh, help in, in talk to. Bud Ritter, uh, he um, wanted you uh, not only to be a good ball player, he wanted you to be a, a good player. Person. The thing about Howard Sharp, he uh, would coach basketball, and we would start at 2.30 in the afternoon in our what we call seventh hour B-Phys Ed class. We wouldn't leave the gymnasium until 8.30 at night. Ray Crow, who, who obviously built addicts from nothing. Ray was instrumental because he, he had been around, uh, grew up with, with whites, 
he, he, he understood the, the white mentality, and he had, it, so he made sure that we didn't do anything that to, to embarrass Christmas Addicts when we played on and off the court. He just made sure we went to class, yeah. made sure you know, we didn't smoke or drink. Uh, he said if he ever heard about it, didn't have to see us, we were off the team. Yeah. So it made sure that, you know, that we were good students, good citizens. They knew how to toe the line and so they've become fine young men because of the training they had under Ray and many of them didn't have, have parents, both parents on. He was kind of a father figure for many of them. Johnny Prado was a great coach too. My high school basketball coach, Dick Cummins, was excellent. Frank Barnes, when I got to Shelbyville. Woody Neal. I played two years under him at Holland. A gentleman named Clifford Robertson, who is still living, I'm great friends with to this day. And uh, before we ever uh, got to shoot buckets, uh, things that we worked on was the fundamentals of the game. Uh, Archie Chad, he was on the advisory board at Bainbridge, and he had won the state titles in Anderson. My coach was Blackie Braden, and uh, he was pretty much a disciplinarian. Uh, very good basketball coach. Jerry Oliver was a tremendous coach. Uh, he was very knowledgeable, he was very enthusiastic, and he was a guy that, that really set the, set the pace in practice. He, he, he instilled in us hard work. He instilled in us taking pride in everything that we would do. Had a great high school basketball coach in Jerry Oliver and then of course Bill Green who has won six state high school championships. Uh, Bill Green, you know, I I coached against him. Uh, well, having Bill Green as a coach was a, a big plus. I mean, he was already a legend before uh, he got to our, our class in 85, uh, 86, 87. You know, Bill Green at Marion, of course, him winning five or six state championships. You know, Jack Butcher would fall in that category as well. Like Jack Butcher, uh, the legend from Lagodi. Well, probably Gunnar Wyman comes to mind as the coach. You know, Gunnar was one of the most colorful. Uh, colorful characters in, in Indiana, Jim Rosensteel. Uh, Norm Held and Anderson and uh, Dave Omer down here at Washington. Uh, Jack Edison, who just retired, I think, was a tremendous coach at Plymouth. D uh, Jim Jones at Terre Haute South. And coach Jim Miller, who finished his coaching career in New Albany. Uh, Pat Rady comes to mind at, at uh, the longtime Terre Haute South coach, who's now at Cloverdale. Coach Cecil Tagg, who is a Hall of Fame uh, inductee and, and uh, He's uh, been a great influence and an asset to my life. Uh, Coach Philpot, who was uh, the fire chief at the time, uh, he was the one that made basketball fun for me. Uh, Jack Kiefer, I think, has done an excellent job. Uh, Basil Bobby, I coached against, and Basil is still coaching in northern Indiana. He coached at Kokomo and Connorsville, took Connorsville to a state championship. You know, I think Al Rhodes is an excellent coach. Yeah, the coaching profession, have great uh, respect for Indiana just because of uh, not just the players, but the respect that there is for uh, the high school coaches uh, in the state of Indiana. They do a great job. Uh, not only are they knowledgeable, but they're very passionate on making sure uh, their players learn to understand how to play the game. But I think there's, that's why there's so many good players that are produced in that state. Uh, even the ones that don't reach the pinnacle, uh, the guys that, that you don't read about in you know, the headlines and the sports pages. Uh, uh, in Indiana, it's something special. And uh, guys, it, it's more than just a, a hobby. It's more than just an extracurricular. It's, it's in your blood. I think the greatest coach ever to come from Indiana was John Wooden, without question. Coach Wooden, of course, he's probably my number one idol as a coach. John Wooden. Uh, just think about him and what he accomplished at UCLA, right from Martinsville. Boys, you know, will be boys, and a lot of times they, they you know, they sort of ignore the coach or thought that they knew more than the coach or could play better than the coach. Well, Woody would get out there with him, and then all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, drop his clipboard and go out onto the floor and challenge the boys, and uh, it probably nine times out of ten would uh, outmaneuver them and score a basket uh, or two, and then. Uh, kind of put them in their place so what they, they would learn that the, that the old coach kind of knew what he was doing. You go through high school, you win a state championship, you're the leading scorer, you have a candidate for Mr. Basketball, you make the all-star team, you know, you think you know everything about basketball, and then you meet John Wooden, and then you realize how little you really, really know about basketball. The northeast part of the state is known for multiple overtimes in Swayze. Old cars in Auburn and flat landscapes in small towns everywhere with 
the second largest city in Indiana, smack dab in the middle in Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne has many museums, theaters, and other cultural experiences, but it's probably best known as a minor league sports town. In fact, it used to be a great draw for major league sports talent, such as the Kikiangas baseball team, major league team, the Daisies, a girls baseball team, and the Zollner Fort Wayne Pistons, which now are the Detroit Pistons. This city is where the first baseball game was played professionally in 1871. It's also considered the birthplace of the NBA when the owner of the Pistons, Fred Zollner, brokered a merger of the BAA and the NBL in 1949. It's 34 to 32 for Fort Wayne. Ralph passes up the Hines, Hines to Glass. Glass back up to Bellion. And Fort Wayne holds that pass. And there's a ball game. Fort Wayne is the state champion. Oh, well, just a special time for us. Uh, Fort Wayne, we were a three-year-old school out of Fort Wayne. Uh, no one believed we could do it. We had to beat the uh, number one, two, and three ranked teams in the state to win it. Uh, just, just getting started out of Fort Wayne, we had to beat a uh, Lafayette Jeff team who was very, very good. Uh, Jeffersonville team led by Wayne Walls. An Anderson team led by co Mr. Basketball Roy Taylor and Tony Marshall. So we had a tough, tough road to hell hole. We beat Marion at Marion in the middle, middle of the season. That gave us confidence that we can get it done. We were 20. Nine and one. We won 26 games in a row to win state championship. A special time. One point lead for Northrop. 35 seconds to go. 57 56. Eight with it for Jeffersonville. 13 seconds. Walls. Turnaround jumper. No good. Scott Skiles, they try to go to Bradley. Quickly up front, right side, Samuelson. All right, fine. Ronaldo Thomas taking it on the drive now. There's Phil Wendell right there. It has gone off Plymouth. That is Anthony Stewart. He had six in the contest, later on in the contest. He did. 22-20, trying to tie it. Good position on the rebound, put back up, and it's still going to fall. Finally, tapped on the lead. It's not 26 to 25. That was really the kind of scoring that Plymouth has come up with. Only four points during this period. Skiles, yes. Strong power move by Ronaldo Thomas again. You know, the fans aren't buying that little act, but he got it anyway, and the officials were right on top of it. Wendell again. Now, here comes Roosevelt, two on one. This afternoon, he has 13 tonight. Power play inside, get two more to the left. A receiver. Oh, great defensive play. Sensational effort from Ron Sissel. Here is Skiles. Yes. I do. Well, there's the two big buckets. Take those by Andre Anders. He has four points tonight. Quickly, Skiles. He ah. Jerry Roosevelt looking for a second state championship. They got it to Skiles. 20 footer. It's good. From the left corner is Skiles. They can't get it to him. Now they do. Great pass. Skiles. Oh, he's double, triple team. Black and gold all over him. Takes it anyway and still a chance to see. There's Skiles dishing it off. Two points. A mirror image of what happened in the first overtime period. But Roosevelt got the first two hoops. They come back and get 71 to 70 with a minute 25 to go. Skiles inside. He got it again. Great career. Yeah, it is. This is great. I I was hoping before the year we could at least get down here. I'm just glad we won. Coach Rose and Coach Edison for a lot of years had some great battles, and I've enjoyed competing against Coach Edison and for five years, and now he's he's retired, but. Uh, it is uh, sad that you weren't able to, to be here for it. I, I came to Warsaw in 1976 with Coach Jim Miller. 
we wanted to take the program to another level. And after four years, coach left and went on to Huntington, and I became the head coach. We'd laid the groundwork in those four years, a regional championship in 80. My first team, we were in the final four in 1981. And that laid the groundwork for the kids that actually won the state championship in 84. So it really was an eight year journey where you just had to keep building confidence where the kids really believed that they could compete with anybody in Indiana. I, I think uh, Jack Edison and the Pilgrims had a lot to do with our championship as well because of the fact that uh, that made it believable to the kids. Also, Basil Lobby was the coach that I started working under at the beginning of my career, and his team won it in 83. So it was just kind of a, a natural progression. Here we go, folks. Hang on. 30 seconds to play for the state title. One point lead by Warsaw. Ben sends basketball. Swan tries to grab a look at the scoreboard here at Market Square Arena. Now to Tolbert. Down to 19 seconds to go. We are inside 15 seconds. Tolbert's got it. They're looking in the middle. Now we're down to 10. Tolbert one on one. Baseline shot is up and it is no good. The shot is missed by Hendrickson and a foul of the rebound is against Ben Sim. All right. Here is Steve Holler. He is two out of three on the night. Ten points. Now with three seconds to go. There it is. If Steve can nail this baby, then Warsaw is going to hang a championship banner in that gymnasium of theirs. He's said it. This ball game is history. Oh. It's all over. The area just northwest and northeast of Indianapolis has long been considered a hotbed of basketball. Nicknamed the Conference of Champions, this area is home of the legendary North Central Conference. Every team in the conference has at least won one state title. And when you have teams from Frankfurt, Logansport, Kokomo, Newcastle, Anderson, Marion, Muncie, you just can't go wrong on any Friday or Saturday night in this region. The first place I visited was Anderson. Anderson's a town that had its ups and downs over the years. The saddest day probably for me was when the school decided to close down the wigwam, which I understand the high costs and everything, but um, it's the second largest high school gym in the world and it held 8,996 people. The Indians have had numerous famous alumni, including Everett Case, who revolutionized the Carolinas basketball systems, uh, Carl Erskine, uh, World Series champ of the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1953. He had 14 strikeouts in one game against the Yankees. And three Mr. Basketballs in Troy Lewis, uh, Kojak Fuller, and the great Jumpin' Johnny Wilson. They've won championships in 1935, 37, and 1946. Um, there's a traditional sharing of an old peace pipe or acting like they have a peace pipe um, between the two cheerleaders and the highlight was the Indian Maiden Brave Dance um, that happens at the beginning of each game. It's really cool. It's hard to describe, but every fan must experience this ritual at least once, preferably against an old rival team.
Mammoth Butler Fieldhouse in Indianapolis is the scene of the 1946 Indiana High School Basketball Finals. There had been some before. Back in the uh, early 30s, uh, Muncie was a very integrated school. So was, uh, so was Anderson. And, uh, but uh, then it was a sort of a low period through the middle 30s, late 30s. And then in uh, Fort Wayne uh, came up in about 42. They had, I think, two or three blacks on the team. And then, then when we came in at 46, uh, that was really the start of uh, what is going on today. ...into its championship round. In this 43rd annual championship game, the Anderson team is wearing the dark uniforms and Fort Wayne the white. Anderson, a state champion in 1935 and again in 1937, is coached by Charles L. Cummings. Fort Wayne team, coached by Murray Mendenhall, were champions in 1943. And tonight they're playing hard for another championship. Johnny Wilson, Anderson Center, sets a new championship game scoring record of 30 points. Anderson leads at halftime 36 to 24. The 15,000 tickets sold for this championship game sets an all-time record and boosts the total number of tournament tickets sold to over one and a quarter million. The final gun, Anderson wins 67 to 53. Blackman had gotten 50 points against us earlier in the year at Marion when they, when they beat us. And I'd tongue-in-cheek said, well, if Blackman gets 50 points a game, we're probably going to get beat. Well, Blackman got 51 or 52 points, and, and Troy got 42, and we ended up winning the game in a double overtime and a classic basketball game, as Marion and Anderson usually have. Each club is led by two. Baseline shot. Just If we got a minute to go in the game and it's still like this, I wouldn't be a bit surprised the way these two clubs go after each other. There's the one you've been waiting for. percent shooter averaging 31.9. In the middle, they got it the other end. So he has four and Blackman has two. If you want to keep an eye on the individual battles, here's Blackman again. Here is Blackman one-on-one. -on -one. Got his man beat. Look out. This is James Blackman on the move. Boy's not bad. Rebound. Well, they got the bounce. Steve Johnson at 6-6. The Giants control it. Here's Blackman. To Blackman, he wants the shot, of course. It's on its way. Well, he just square up. He just has a great, great move to the hoop. Troy Lewis at the 54 seconds in a 72-70 game. Troy Lewis again. Will there be three overtimes for crying out loud? Blackman baseline. Yes, sir. Blackman with six points in this overtime session. Down to seven. Down to six. On the right side. There's the shot that's up and no good. And picked up and put up and good at the buzzer. It counts. The basket is good by David Jackson. At the buzzer, the rebound by Jackson is up, and it is good. And in double overtime, Anderson has beaten Marion 89-87. to 87. Anderson still has some pretty vocal fans, including the guy I'm about ready to show you. And also Kojak Fuller, who still yells and runs up and down the sidelines screaming like a major fan. <laughs> Little town of Alexandria has long had a small school reputation for being a giant killer. So I moved on to the famed Newcastle area and the largest high school gym in the entire world, Chrysler Fieldhouse. My dad, Vernon, he said uh, he'd never seen a high school gym or any gym really as big as that in his life. Of course, he's from the little town of Saluda, Indiana. He was right though, seeing that sunken gym, it holds about 9,325 people. It has the most beautiful parquet flooring this side of the Boston Gardens. And walking in to see a, a game here just blew me and my dad away. It's the home of scoring machines, Ray Pavey, Kent Benson and Steve Alford. And the Trojans won titles in 1935 and 2006. Kent Benson, a 6'9 sophomore with two shots, two seconds to go. First cut. 60, 59. What pressure on this young sophomore. If he can make this one, it'll be tied. We're in the second overtime. It's up. It's good. 60 all, two seconds, one second, 
Long shot, Underwood. No good. Elkhart taking their time. They lead by three. 13, 12. Underwood underneath the Babcock. Puts it up and in. 65, 60. Three, two, one. Long shot, Martin. I watched a Hall of Fame classic game and an East-West All-Star game here. And both games kind of lacked the attendance that the Trojans against some of the rivals are used to. But I think any basketball fan owes it to themselves to see a game here at least one time in their lives. And also stop at the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, which is right next door. It's probably the coolest museum in the state. I breezed through Shenandoah for no apparent reason. Quick stop by Fairmount, where Cool was born. Is James Dean cooler than a fat cat and Jim Davis? I'll let you decide. Muncie's one of the true great pockets of basketball in the state. Muncie Fieldhouse was built in 1928 and has lost very little of its luster and charm. The only problem is, like all schools, some of the attendance has been down in the last 10 to 20 years. To go along with their royalty-laden purple school colors, the Muncie Bearcats have an impressive state record eight championship banners hanging ominously from the gym rafters. The so-called triangle of basketball is Anderson, Newcastle, and Muncie, but Muncie Central owns the current title of King because of their eight championships. However, they have somewhat fallen off the radar in the last 10 years or so because of the real dominance of the Indianapolis teams. Great players and coaches from this area include Ron Bonham, Jack Moore, Chandler Thompson, Bonzi Wills, and your three-time state championship coach, Bill Harrell. Seventy-eight. Uh, we were just coming uh, back in basketball at Muncie Central. We'd been down uh, before I came there, and the year prior to the '78 state championship, I think we won 13 and lost 10. And uh, I thought we had a, a, a real good team, uh, but I never was sure uh, just how far we could advance because uh, year in and year out we have a lot of trouble getting out of our sectional. Usually, when we get out of our sectional, we go uh, very far in state. 52-50, Muncie Central, Jack Moore. You may be getting tired of hearing his name, but he is the kind of a guy who seems to always be in the middle of whatever's going on. Bridges. Two minutes and 41 seconds of playing time. Puzzle had it taken away by Jack Moore. The lead pass up to shoot grab. Bates his man out and gets the hoop. Cam Cameron gets two of them back. Now oh, watch this. More penetrates will bring it back out. Gets inside. Got the bucket. Cam Cameron has it. Terra holds off with a chance to tie. Also a 10 footer and an air ball. Picked up and back up and good. That is Tony Watson. Watson's 14 point of the game and it's tied at 16. Seven seconds. Six and a foul on Watson. Here is Jackie Moore. Wasn't any doubt that was going in, was it? He needs this one. Six seconds to go. Five, 
for a 30-footer. It's good! Richard Wilson from about 30 feet away, and we've got overtime. Time. He draws some attention. Here is Moore. Commit the ball. Terre Haute side. Have to follow. Jordan Neff is yelling, follow, 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 and there it is. It's all on Jack Moore's shoulders. This is Richard Wilson, a 30-footer again. He got it again. One second remains. Muncie Central leads 65-64. They throw it in. Here's the shot from the midcourt stripe. It hit the backboard, and that's it. Ray McCollum. There will be no foul shots. The bonus is not in effect yet. Into Kurtz. Wild Kurtz with 10. 61 to 58, 18 seconds to go. Defensive play and a foul. Here is the youngster, the 5'9 senior. Leads the club when it comes to situations where they've got to have the bucket or they need to protect the ball. This is the guy who does it. Uh, Troy Bridges. And Troy just turned out the lights. Down at the other end of the floor, the other four Bearcats are waving at their fans, and they've begun the celebration. It is all but over. Five seconds. Here is Sean Teague. He gets the bucket, but it's too little, too late, and the game is over. You know, we played in the morning game. We played against Damon Bailey. He was a sophomore at the time. And the night game against Sean Kent. Uh, and my favorite moment is probably got to be the 360 dunk that I had at the end of the game. We'll see. Concord in green. The Bearcats in white, and Muncie controls the tip, gets it up court in a hurry to Sam Long. John Kemp, he's six foot 11, he's got the ball, and he plays outside. Well, this is the second ball game for both these clubs today. They had about two more hours. Great pass from Munch to Sean Kemp. There is Johnson. Now Larkin. Larkin and Johnson are the guards. Still much in the middle. Oh! Concord comes out of there with it. We're halfway through the first quarter, and it's an 8 8 ball game. And another there's it. Trophy case at Muncie Central High School. Three and a half minutes to go on the half. Good pass from Bill Mutz to Sean Kemp. You get the shot off. Some of the, some of the mind games are interesting, Tom. Right. They really are. He had a nice touch. <laughs> Richmond in overtime. 30 seconds into the second half. Chandler Thompson in trouble on the baseline. Chandler Thompson on a great assist from Victor Young. Thompson has 17. And Don Osler points out, here's the steal, by the way. Here is Candler Thompson with a 360. This, these are the first substitutions Bill Harrell has made of the entire ball game of the, well, yeah, of the entire ball game. Looks like the subs are not going to make it. Nope, they're not. Chandler Thompson with four. And another slam jam for Chandler, and that's the ball game. My next stop took me to the land of giants, literally. Marion boasts one of the greatest basketball credentials in the state, has seven state titles, four Mr. Basketballs, two in the same year. Uh, great players from the Marion system, Stretch Murphy, Dave Colescott, James Blackman, Jay Edwards, Lyndon Jones, Zach Randolph, currently a great player in the NBA. It's a very emotional thing, basketball at Marion, Indiana. It's very emotional when we lose, it's very emotional when we win. Uh, we graduated four kids off that, starters off that team and kept David Colescott. And in 76, he led us back to the state tournament with four no-namers and Colescott. Two shots coming to Dave Colescott. First one is up and good, right through there. That's the first points of the evening for Marion's leading scorer. Second one, no good, tipped up and in by Neal. Zone still being used by the Giants. From this side, Schaus, good. It'll be Neal jumping with uh, Miley as we start this second quarter. Ball up, tipped in back, Cole Scott's got it, basket. Rebounded up and brought out of there by Freshwater. Dennis Gowen slows him down, now he's on the run. Dave Colescott from the side, good. Four point lead for Rushville. Goddard open, short. Miley rebounds, gets it. Rebounded out by Goddard. Three on nothing. Rick Goins is going to score it. 
Joe Neal from the side, good. Rick Goins, good. Rick Goins from this side, good. Joe Neal open, got it. Jeff Bragg up and in. Dave Colescott, got it. He's the only kid in Indiana high school basketball that has won two state championships, had won the Tressler Award, and was elected Mr. Basketball. Uh, Cruz and the rebound comes off to the Marion Giants. Lobbed inside and deflected, picked up by Edwards. He got the roll, which is almost twice that. Woody Austin. Then I think last Saturday night he took about 13 in a row without hitting a basket. Market Square Arena for this championship game. Oh, there's an outstanding pass and Kyle Percy with a Derry Keys. Bowman is not afraid to handle that basketball. Dishes it off inside to Cruz. Bowman. Unless you think he handles the ball too much, this is very common. Oh, well, there's a great pass. The control of their tempo. Here's the steal. Here's Lyndon Jones for the Snowbird. Rustell in the center slot, but Persinger didn't score for Marion either. So each block came up one score is shy. Paul period underway, right in front of us, inbounded by Kyle Persinger into Lyndon Jones. They lob it down low, and they the slam. Workman like ball game here this evening. Woody Austin. Edwards will take him. 35 points for Jay Edwards. Final three seconds. That's going to be all she wrote. It's gone. It's history. The Marion Giants have just tied history with their third successive state championship. And finally, the principal, Dr. John Marshall. Carmel, Indiana has two Mr. Basketball brothers in Billy and Dave Shepard, and they won one state title with the youngest brother, Scott, in 1977. Carmel is also one of the most affluent communities in the Midwest. If you want to see how nice this actual community is, you'll probably have to go see it for yourself. It's kind of too nice, and it just depresses me. So. I have to say though, the Shepherd family, one of the most entertaining interviews I've ever done. It's fun to see them tell stories on each other and it just goes to show brother rivalry never goes away. Carmel with the ball, 11 seconds to go. Pass intercepted by Morris, jump ball call between Morris and Herman. Morris jumping with Mark Herman. Eleven seconds to go. 52, 51, Morris tip, intercepted by Burrow, nine seconds, eight, long pass, up and in by Ogle, up and in by Ogle, four seconds left, and a timeout is called. 53, 52, Carmel leads, four seconds to go, East Chicago, Washington with the ball. Clock is running, three, two, one, Morris, it's no good. Traveling to Kokomo was a pretty cool experience. I really liked their town and the gym atmosphere in the 1948 Memorial Gymnasium was, was really great. This is home. This is my home. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of the places on earth that I can walk in and I just feel so much nostalgia, so much history when I walk in here. It's such a connection to me. And it's a place on this earth that means a lot to me. It was a great time for my entire family, from the drumline opening to the Lebanon team almost coming back, riding the hot shooting of freshman Trey Hendricks, uh, and finally the oddest bullfight I've ever seen in my entire life.
Two great players from Kokomo area include Jim Goose Ligon and the Splendid Splinter, Jimmy Rill. Apparently, Jimmy Rill, if you didn't guard him past half court, he'll shoot on you. So, so Dick Van Arsdale, he'll try a one-hander. Good! Dick Van Arsdale scoring for the Manuel Redskins. Ten seconds remaining in the first half. Off on the far side to Ronnie Hughes, a soft one-hand shot. Good! And it goes to Tom Van Arsdale. To Cobb, back to free throw lane, he stops. Back to Cummings. And to Dick Van Arsdale, good. Off to Pryor, to Scott, his shot, short. Ligon has it, and Ligon has a chance to cut that to a one point deficit. The first shot, good. It'll be Cummings this time against Cox. The tip is taken by Kokomo, off to Ligon. 20 seconds remain. Manuel ahead only by two points. A shot by Scott. Up. Good. It's all tied. 62-62. Three seconds. A shot by Dick Van Arsdale. No good. Picked up underneath by Scott. Here's the free throw by Scott. Up. No good. He misses. 19 seconds remain in the overtime period. Kokomo on the attack now. 17, 16 seconds. The score tied. 66-66. Off it goes to Cox. To Pryor. Holds the ball high above his head. And it goes to Ronnie Hughes. Hughes drives toward the basket, four seconds. A shot by Glover, no good. Whistle underneath. The foul was against Cabo Manuel. Here's the shot by Hughes, up. It's good. Kokomo by one point. Second free throw, up, good by Hughes. It's Kokomo, long, long shot by Van Arsdale. No good. There's the end of the ball game. There are thousands of ball players throughout the history of Indiana high school basketball, me included in that, many of which have faded into obscurity, me included with that. It takes a special talent to be remembered and fall into the category of a great legend. Here are some of those players. Homer comes along, six foot four, and that was a giant at day and age. Most teams had 5'10", 5'11", centers, maybe a six, six footer. But uh, you have to remember, the ball went back after every basket and you re -jumped. So he controlled every tip. And they were the first team to ever score 100 points in a basketball game. And they were not only considered Indiana's finest in winning the state championship, they were considered the greatest team in the world in that day and age. This team also only had 11 boys in high school, 25 students total, and no gym. They were the gymless wonders. Robert Fuzzy Vandiver from, uh, from Franklin High School and then into Franklin College, and he certainly is one of the greatest, in my opinion. Hey, Johnny Wilson. Uh, Billy Garrett out of Shelbyville was probably one of the true greats of Indiana. Uh, Dave Shellhouse, of course. Uh, you know, Jimmy Ray, all, uh, Ray Pavey. N.T. Shine uh, out of uh, South Bend. Of course, Goose Legan was awful. I enjoyed watching Goose play from Kokomo here. I think the person that's made the, the greatest impact on Indiana basketball from, from a national standpoint, I think, is Bobby Plum. And Billy Keller. I like Ron Bonham a lot. And Billy Shepard, you know, he was a great player at Carmel. The Van Arsdale twins, they played for Indianapolis Manual. Ishikawa Roosevelt had a guy named Jim Bradley who I, I believe I, I read in a magazine one time that Julius Irving said he was the best player he'd ever played against. Monty Tao. Bob Ford who played at Evansville North. Terry Dissinger. Marion Pierce. Turkovich up north I think went out to UCLA. We had uh, two Mr. Basketballs, Kent Benson coming from Newcastle and mm -hmm. Steve Alford uh, and we had other players. Uh, Ray Pavey was a good player here. Jerry Seasting who went on to play at Purdue and then went on to play because Troy Lewis is a great player from Anderson. Well, Troy Lewis that, that played at Anderson. I mean, we used to, you know, go at each other when we played those guys. And Watching Scott Skiles in, in the state championship, uh, you know, in the in the show that he put on. I like Scott Skiles a lot. He was a 
he did you know a little bit of everything. He, uh, and Skiles was a great shooter and was quick and was cocky and was all the things, all the things you like to have a good guard do. And, and he just willed Plymouth to to the state title. In 1983, to win the state championship, we had to defeat Steve Alford and the Newcastle Trojans in the semi-state. Uh, Steve Alford, I mean, he was Mr. Basketball. Wow. And Newcastle will run its record to 23 and 5. I have offered Don now for 24 consecutive free throws. And then came along Sean Kemp. Um, I, you know, I think one of the greatest to come out is Sean Kemp. Uh, you know, he was just a man uh, amongst boys in high school. Whatever he wanted to do, he did. Sean Kemp was a phenomenal uh, athlete. Uh, I played against Rick Fox, Sean Kemp. Bonzi Wells, I mean, the list goes on and on, Allen Henderson. The, the best player I ever coached was Allen Henderson at Burbuff. Uh, Damon Bailey at, from Bedford, North Lawrence. So. Damon Bailey, I guess, comes to mind. What a storybook career, you know, high school career he had. Probably the two best players that I've either played against or, or coached against would probably be Damon Bailey and Anthony Winchester. Uh, as far as affecting and getting the most out of his ability, and making other players better was Damon Bailey. My all-time favorite player to watch was Damon Bailey, probably. I, I realize that, in, in retrospect, he probably was not the best athlete, or, or maybe not even the best player all around, but as far as a story to follow and the, the dramatic ending of the state championship, that, he was my, by, my, by far my favorite, I think. Glenn Robinson. Glenn Robinson coming through, another fantastic player. The last one that I remember seeing was, was Glenn Robinson. Glenn Robinson was another player who was terribly dominating. Well, Glenn Robinson, of course, probably was the best player because he got player of the year. I'll go with Big Dog just because he's Purdue Purdue guy. I have to say, uh, I might have to say Greg because, I mean, he was just unstoppable. Greg Oden is a player that dominated high school basketball for the years that he played. Greg Oden and then Eric Gordon and Mike Conley next. It is Greg Oden and then followed closely by Eric Gordon and Mike Conley. Michael Conley is the best point guard uh, that made teams better uh, of anybody I ever saw play the high school game. Greg, Greg Oden, uh, because I mean, I mean they won three straight <laughs> championships. Well, the one you won't forget is Greg Oden. Uh, Mike Conley as a point guard, uh, you won't see too many guys. As, as good as a point guard as him. I mean, I would say Greg Oden, but I mean, he's just the most dominant. Certainly Eric Gordon this year, and then last year, Greg Oden and, and Mike Conley, just outstanding talents. Uh, you know, Greg Oden, Mike Conley, um, Eric Gordon. You know, have a player such as an Eric Gordon that, that obviously has got a lot of basketball ahead of him, but had a very good high school career. And uh, of course, Mr. Eric Gordon, I mean, you average 30 points in high school, uh, make it to the state finals the same year, I mean, you got to give it to him. To Rick Mount. Uh, Rick Mount. You know, Rick Mount was a tremendous uh, high school shooter. I played at Lebanon uh, High School for Jim Rosensteel. Rick Mount was someone I idolized. I mean, I loved watching him play. How could you not like him? I never saw a better shooter than Rick Mount. Rick Mount, in the summertime, I'd go down to Lebanon just to get a chance to work out with him. He was kind enough for a young kid to come down there and spend time with. Rick Mount, of course, who was probably the greatest shooter in basketball, Indiana High School basketball uh, history. Well, of course, Rick Mount um, was probably the best shooter ever in the Big Ten.
George McGinnis. George McGinnis, I uh, had an opportunity to play against George in the NBA and uh, uh, what a great player he was. George McGinnis in Indianapolis, Washington, he, he was a very special player. He was probably in his time one of the best players that I think I played with. Uh, he was 6'8", six, 6'9", six, could handle the ball strong outside shooter. Probably the first high school player I remember was George McGinnis. Just a man among boys, really. Uh, that, that 1969 Indianapolis, Washington team with him and Steve Downing uh, just ran through people. Uh, George McGinnis, uh, who by the way was the guy that broke my state tournament record. Uh, I had 128 points in four games and he, he had more than that in, in three games in the final four. George McGinnis and Steve Downing. Oh, what a pair. You're thinking about Larry Bird. Larry Bird, one of the one of the greatest basketball players to come out of the state of Indiana. Larry Bird. You know, Larry Bird with the success that he's had. Uh, I like to watch Bird play. Larry Bird. I have to say Larry Bird. An unbelievable player made everybody around him better. Larry Bird was, he was amazing. I mean, that's everything he could do. Larry Bird, who I think is one of those that's smart a basketball player, or one percentage say one of the smartest basketball players that I've ever seen. He didn't have all of God's talents. He worked at it. He made himself a great player. Uh, Larry was a uh, six, seven, young, immature, uh, gangling kid from the southern part of Indiana uh, that had talent. And he himself, I don't think, knew exactly how talented he was or how good he was going to be. Oscar Robertson. It stands to reason you're, you're, you're thinking about Oscar Robertson. The biggest name I've heard is Oscar Robertson. Oscar Robertson, I idolized him. Nobody compared to Oscar Robertson. I consider Oscar Robertson the greatest basketball player that ever played the game. Uh, I always thought he was the best basketball player I ever saw. Oscar Robertson, right at the top of your list, any level you want. I, I still believe that. Oscar Robertson is probably the greatest all-around player ever. Yeah, he averaged triple doubles. He did everything for his team, two state championships. I'd say Oscar Robertson just because he did everything. The Oscar Robertson was the best player. The Oscar Robertson, what a what a phenomenal player. You know, he, he was just a whole package. When you think about a player, uh, you think about Oscar Robertson with, without question. So I would think that Oscar may have been the best all-around uh, basketball player in the state of Indiana. You know, you can come here to the Indiana High School Basketball Hall of Fame and see all the tremendous accomplishments that uh, Oscar had. And, and Oscar Robinson was, uh, without question, the greatest player that has ever graced this state of Indiana. Well, I don't think there's ever been a guard, better guard play basketball than Oscar Robinson. When I was a kid growing up, I, I, Oscar Robinson was it. I mean, he was he was the best. He was the greatest. Um, I, I and I can recall vividly when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, going to see him play for the uh, Cincinnati Royals. They happened to have a game at uh, the Fairgrounds Coliseum, and I remember that. I remember that vividly. Now, he was literally he was larger than life. Oscar Robertson could could do anything. Oscar, I believe Oscar in high school back in those days could have scored 60 points a game if he'd have wanted to. Oscar Robertson, what a sweet ball player. And he could do everything. He could run, he was fast, he could dribble, he could shoot, he could guard. There wasn't a skill on the court today that he didn't have in that early era. There's a pickup game. And uh, here was this guy, uh, we was watching, and here was this guy uh, just killing everybody. And uh, so we want to know, and T. Shy and I said, well, who is that kid? And, uh, and they said it was Oscar Robinson. And we said, well, God, what high school does he go to? They said, he's in junior high. And he's playing <laughs> against all these high school <coughs> kids. In my opinion, he is the greatest basketball player of all time. Better than Michael Jordan because he did it all. Rebounding, assist, and scoring. 
and he had seasons of the triple-double where today they write it up as a big deal when somebody has a triple-double and Oscar did it for the entire year. Unbelievable performance. It's like a ballet. It's like a dance that you do. You know you, know you do things without even thinking about them. Our state capital is the 12th largest city in the U.S., second largest city in the Midwest, second largest state capital, and the largest da, 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 landlocked city in the U.S. It just goes to show, if you look at obscure facts long enough, you're going to be the best at something. Indianapolis is a vibrant city full of sports, entertainments, arts, commerce, and one of the coolest downtown areas anywhere. Circle Center and the Soldiers and Sailors Monument are truly sights to behold. If the name Naptown applies to the city anymore, you're probably not trying very hard. There are things to do day or night, rain or shine. Okay, well, the rain isn't a perfect time to visit Indy, but it does make for a great nighttime shot, or maybe a scene in a lonely French film. I always find things to do here, including going to some of the most competitive high school basketball games probably anywhere in the country. The first Indy school on my visit was the Arsenal Tech Titans, which used to be a U.S. Arsenal. Some of the great players, Joe Sexton and Landon Turner. Merrick Manual High School has had a lot of drop-offs in attendance over the years, but they do boast two of the greats from Indiana, the Van Arsdell twins. Tom and Dick both were Trester Award winners. They were both Mr. Basketballs. They were all-stars and they both played in the pro game. They almost had the exact same stats in the pros playing for two different teams. Southport has a great old sunken field house. It still looks nice even though it's empty right now. Uh, so hopefully their attendance hasn't fallen off for a big school. One of my favorite all-time UK players graduated from Southport, Louis Dampier. I actually like the Lawrence Central versus Lawrence North rivalry. I would have loved to have seen the Greg Oden, Mike Conley versus Eric Gordon game, but this rivalry is pretty cool as well. I also like the Beer Hat Kid. You don't see enough of that in high schools, unless you're in Jasper. Place in the state, you'll probably see a seven foot sophomore that is starting JV and not playing varsity. Indianapolis, Washington has two championships, one in 1965 and one in 1969. Mr. Pacer, Billy Keller, was an integral part of the 65 team, and the 69 team started the Twin Towers of Steve Downing and George McGinnis. All three were professional players and loved by many Hoosiers not only for their play, but also their service to the community throughout the years. Turn around, back to Winkler. Winkler from 25 feet, good! Not it again. Stolen by Washington. Keller to Bob. Bob of the offensive court to Gladson. Back to Bob. Northside needs the ball. 23 seconds. Taylor has the ball. A whistle. Foul called. Taylor can make it four. 20 seconds left. Good. A four point lead for Northside. They need two quick baskets. Pass intercepted by Mark Glasson and the Washington Continentals have won the 1965. Big George McGinnis was a two-time ABA champ of the Pacers, a three-time NBA and ABA All-Star and first team selection, and an ABA MVP and scoring title winner. It's great that Indianapolis, Washington has now come out of the closed market and started teaching young minds again. Again, the zone press by the Raiders. McGinnis 
Good. Arnold to Downing. Good. McGinnis way outside. Good. Beatty puts it up from the corner. Good. Goods puts it up. Good. Six baskets for Henry Good. Also has four free throws. Stolen by Beatty. He's got it. 13 seconds left. A pressure free throw for Abner Nibs. He's got it. 79-74. Goods trying to let that clock run. He's got a gun quickly. He does. He's got it. 79-76. Five, four, three, two, one. It's all over. Brad Ripple took it to New Albany Bulldogs in 1980 to win a state title. New Albany Bulldogs bring it in, getting full court pressure now by the Rockets of Brad Ripple High. Brad Ripple ranked number seven by the Associated Press, number four by UPI. New Albany, number two in both those polls. Ricky Johnson. Stacy Turan, the lead pass to oh, Jeff Robinson. What a Great play. play. New Albany. Rolling through the season 20 and 0 regular season play when the New Albany sectional, the Seymour Regional, the Evansville Semi State. Outside is Bennett. He has started some games this year. Here's Tracy. Atkinson on the rebound. And the, the New Albany Bulldogs will suffer their first defeat of the year. But what an outstanding season they have. 73 64. Shot is up. It is good. It will count. The celebrating begins in Indianapolis. They brought the state championship back to town. Lawrence North had one of the most dominating high school basketball dynasties between 2004 and 2006. With Greg Oden, Mike Connolly, and the great coach Jack Kiefer. How can you play against these guys in a high school setting? The win against Bloomington South took only five shots. 19 minutes, he was in foul. Center. They got a point guard who can score in Conley. They got great defenders. Wyndham, the good post player himself. And look at that move by Oden. Big guy way outside now. Conley a long three. It's perfect. That's Conley. He'll fire another long three, and it's perfect again. Conley with the rebound. And look at him go to the hoop, score. Him. And now he goes right inside to the hoop with a left hand. This is uh, this is just great watching the best player in the country. Long three by Jenkins and he hit made it a, a runaway and Box is going to fire a wide open. He makes the catch and the dunk. I love five to Freeman and he drops the second half. Odin catches deep in the post right to the hoops. Mike Conley had 16 in the first half trying to add to the total and here's Conley to end the quarter and it's rebound. I'm going to get to coach these two guys after tonight. <laughs> That's his only worry. That's That's there you see the 4A state champs in Indiana for a third consecutive year. Finally I arrived at what I consider the holy grail of all basketball stories. The story of the Indianapolis Christmas Addicts Fighting Tigers. It's not only the story of the first Indianapolis team to win a state title, but it's also the story of the first all-black state championship team in any sport in the United States. I say this because Crispus Attics was an all-black school created in 1927 to give blacks a separate but equal education. This is a horrible thing to do, but Crispus Attics actually excelled. Most of their teachers had master's degrees and PhDs, and the high quality of education became a hallmark of this school. I think that surprised many throughout the state during this time. Crispus Attics basketball was a major source of pride for community members and eventually the entire state throughout the years. However, there were racial tensions throughout Indiana and the rest of the country before and after their two state championships. City officials would not allow the Tigers to go around Monument Circle more than once before they were ushered back to their West Side Community Park. In a conversation the night of their first state championship, Oscar Robertson said to his dad, quote, Dad, they don't want us. Great players include Oscar Robertson, Halle Bryant, Willie Mayweather, Bailey Robertson, Willie Gardner, and all-time great coach, Ray Crow. 1955, we played against a, it was the first time in the history of Indiana that two black teams played for a championship. Crispus Attucks and uh, Gary Roosevelt, which Dick Barnett was on that team. He played many, many years for in the pro ranks.
Anytime you get competition, it makes you a better basketball player. We played, everybody played together in the summertime, different, around different parks and whatnot. So, you know, it was not, it was not like that you didn't know how a guy played. It's just a matter of execution fundamentals. And we had very good fundamentals at Addict. Uh, Ray, Ray Crow was a, was a great teacher. Didn't talk a lot, but he got the message across. But we were the first team to go undefeated in 1956. The greatest team I ever saw was the 1956 Addicts team, Oscar's senior year. They went unbeaten. They were the first team ever to go unbeaten. And during the course of the season in the tournament, they beat seven out of the top ten teams in the state. I don't think that's ever happened before, and it very likely will never happen again. It's like a ballet. It's like a dance that you do. You know, you know, you do things without even thinking about them. Now, years later, the legacy of the school and community is far beyond the confines of just basketball. It is a legacy of accomplishment, honor, and respect. I made it a point to take my wife and young daughters to the Crispus Attic School and Museum so that they may know and experience this part of our state's history. Section 10. It's intermission time, folks. I have to say the one thing Del Lawrence, author of Hoosier Hysteria Roadbook, left out in his game aesthetics section is the halftime show experience. The halftime shows are as varied in theme as they are in talent. The key element here is that these amateurs had to put their all into their performances and deserve some mention in this documentary. I consider them good, bad, ugly, and most often cheesy, but always entertaining. Eastern section. I didn't actually see the Greensburg Pirates play in their gym on this trip. I just wanted to see why they called Greensburg the Tree City. Oh, that's why. There's been a tree growing out of their courthouse since the 1870s. It's like that scene in National Lampoon's Vacation where they go to see the second largest ball of string. When I told my wife we were going to see it, she thought it was crazy. Okay, I'm taking I-65 North. I'm going to go across from Franklin and we're going to Shelbyville, Indiana. Shelbyville High School, home of the Golden Bears. Um, they won a championship in 1947 with the star Bill Garrett. And we're actually going to the Bill Garrett Memorial Gymnasium, named after him. He was, a little fact here, he was the first African-American player in the Big Ten and he integrated basically into the Big Ten uh, Conference. So, there you go. Well, I didn't have a good career actually, but I was fortunate enough to play for the 47 Shelbyville State Championship team as a junior that year. Uh, we had uh, five seniors as starters and five juniors as a uh, reserve. And uh, due to the leadership of, I guess, Bill Garrett, why he took us to the state finals and we won the state that year and he ended up being Mr. Basketball. So that was the highlight of my basketball career actually. Okay, we're heading to Rushville, Indiana, the Rushville Lions. They're actually a really uh, big rival with Connorsville and we're going there probably next. Rushville has a really nice gym from 1926. It's an old relic that uh, has a lot of rows of wooden bleachers, permanent bleachers probably about 15 to 20, and it has steel girding on the rafters. Really nice, trimmed in red. So, that's where we're headed. Up next, Connersville. Connersville's the Spartan, Spartan Bowl is where we're going to. Um, I've kind of felt like I've been here before because I kind of have. 
It actually is the exact same design as Newcastle's Chrysler Fieldhouse, and it's made by the same exact architect. But it was built a couple years earlier, so that's where we're headed. Our coach, uh, Myron Dickerson, our coach said we picked three times that year. We picked in the second game of the season against Jeffersonville, and then we picked uh, in our uh, last game of the regular season going into the tournament. And then, uh, you know, there we were in the final four, the first time held at Assembly Hall, and was able to cut the nets. It's all over. The ball game is all over. The final score, 80 for Connersville, 63 for Gary West. He's got it right side. Off to the brother, and off they go to the other side. Now to David Jackson. Now they've got it to Troy. <laughs> rebound comes out on a long rebound to Wayne Crabtree. Rebounded by Connersville again and put back up and it's gone. From the team with the ball, the Anderson Indians are down by one and they are looking for Troy Lewis. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go keep it away from him. He's there got it, it right now. He makes the move, gets the shot, and missed it. And the rebound comes off the Connersville and the game is over. The Connersville Spartans have just won the state championship. The eastern part of the state has numerous neat little stops along US 40 which is actually called National Road. It was actually the first road built from the federal government funds going from east to west. And it was a huge major route for westward expansion during the 19th century. Richmond's a very interesting city. It's been home to the Richmond group artists. It's called the Lawnmower Capital. It's also called the Rose City. And it's the smallest community to support an opera and a symphony orchestra. Hoagie Carmichael recorded Stardust here as well. I don't even know who that is, do you? A few NBA coaches come from here as well as players. Most famous athlete might be Lamar Lundy from the Fearsome Foursome. The Red Devils finally won a state basketball title in 1992. Oh yeah, this is the home of someone named Wilbur Wright. I guess he messed with planes or something. Jeff, take it away. Here's the lead the other way. This is Billy Wright. Richmond defeated Jeffersonville. By this time of the game, they've made half a dozen substitutions. Brower on the breakaway shot. Yes. Jornstein had it momentarily. And Bobby picked up by Richmond. They'll get the outside. They can uh, stay sharp mentally while well, they're going to have a lot of physical zip left. 1917. Lafayette Jeff out in front. Hamill in the corner for three. And they got another field goal by Chad Austin. Johnson had almost vacated the area, but that ball was right on target. And Jeff after a miss by Jared Powers. At the other end, here's Brower again. They're on both teams, but that's really a lot of it due to defense. 46-43. That's Billy Wright here. He makes some fine passes. Look at that bounce pass along the baseline to Austin. Good body control. And have yet to score in this final period. Sanders got it down inside, and Lafayette Jeff with the basketball. Hamill for three. Oh, yes. The night he had two this afternoon. It's 65 61. At the other end, yes. Line. It's going to be over, and it is over. And the Richmond Red Devils have won. The South Central section. Franklin is the home of the Grizzly Cubs. More importantly, this is the home of the Franklin Wonder Five headed up by Fuzzy Vanderveer and coached by Ernest Grizz Wagner. They're first to win the championship three years in a row. Well, this coach is no dummy either, so if you win the state three years in a row and your wonder if I is about to graduate, it's time to move on. So he went from Franklin High School across town to Franklin College. Several of the boys went with him, and they won two national championships in their division. Jacksonville is a city that seems very isolated, even though it's near a major metropolitan area. They do have a great basketball history in winning three state titles in 1924, 27, and 33, along with multiple trips to the finals. They have coach Glenn Curtis, Mel Payton, Jerry Seastein, I'm a huge Celtics fan, and the greatest player coach ever, John Wooden. The life-size mannequin doesn't look much like Wooden, but I guess the thought's there. I really like the gym with the home section that has the wooden backrests, and I also like the great western and mushroom and Swiss burgers that they sell in their concession stands. 
The problem is that on this night, my dad and I saw the Bloomington South team, which became state titleists, mop up the Artesians to the dismay of their home crowd. Bloomington area houses two very large and very impressive high schools in Bloomington North and South. I first watched Bloomington South take on Edgewood. Basically, it was Garrett Butcher versus the Jordan Holes All-Stars from Bloomington South. I'd say it was one of the loudest, most out-of-control games I've probably seen in a long time. Eric Gordon even made an appearance with his brief stay with the Hoosiers trying to recruit. An all-out war was probably possible and was very nearly delivered, but South was just too much for the Brown Brigade in the end. I actually had a friend tape Bloomington South versus North game. Featured the South team against a young up-and-comer named Ray McCollum Jr. His father started at Indiana. They eventually moved to Detroit and he now plays for his father in college. The Bedford North Lawrence Stars had one of the greatest stars to ever don a high school jersey. That player was Damon Bailey, state's all-time leading scorer. He was groomed to be a Greek god of basketball, from the legendary visit of Coach Bob Knight when he was in eighth grade, to his glorious finale in winning the state championship in front of a high school record crowd of more than 41,000 people. Damon has led a basketball life of almost cult-like status. I remember going with my dad to the Seymour sectional in 1990 to see their team play and thinking that it was like watching the Beatles get on and off their tour bus. People just watched this guy in awe. He went on to have a nice career in college and played a little bit in the NBA until his injuries started hampering his success. He's now a successful businessman in his hometown of Bedford. And a state marker in Heltonville, his elementary school, shows that community appreciation for a legend in the state of ball legends. Change time. Hilliard, two minutes and ten seconds to play here in this first quarter of play. Here's Jamar Johnson with the steal on the passes. Well, they were very effective. This is one of the better passing high school teams you'll ever see. Here's a three. Yes, sir. It's been very good early. The Concord press has been a problem at times. There's that clear out again, and there's Bailey. And they got it back into Johnson. That's a set play. Posted down low, much up and good. Will it count? And the foul is against Bedford North Lawrence. A little trouble in the three point or the three uh, second area. Now gets the inside turnaround pass. The chance. Four point lead, Concord. Bailey, yes. Back in. Just the free throw. Bailey's got it. It's 58 to 57. Concord leads by one with a minute and 15 to play. Now they've got all four offensive men low, with the exception of Damon Bailey outside with the ball. You see him against Swanson. One, one, on one. one. That's just final 50 seconds. They are down by one. Here's the baseline shot by Johnson. Please get themselves into overtime. Here's Johnson. Rebounded by Jamar again. Took it back out behind the arc. Here's Massey. Rebounded by Concord again. This is Micah Sharp. Rebounded by Concord again. Here's the shot That's off it. the mark. That's the it. ball game is over. Columbus, Indiana is a big and a small town. It has architecture, um, art. It's considered one of the safest, most playful, and most architecturally significant cities in the United States. It's also home to one of the best rivalries in the state of Indiana, the Columbus North Bulldogs versus the Columbus East Olympians. The rivalry is always heated and has had the occasional fight and feud and sometimes rumors of referee bribes.
famous alumni include Ray Eddy, Bob Wellmer, Jerry Newsom, Tom McKinney, Steve Wellmer, Tom Arnold, Coach Bill Stearman, and Chuck Taylor. Yeah, that Chuck Taylor, you know, the Converse shoe fame, right? All of whom are in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Locally, we've had all-stars Tom Arnholt, Jerry Newsom, Steve Hollenbeck, and uh, others, including Steve Wilmer, who now is the quintessential John's Word college basketball official, and he's got to get a Final Four assignment one of these years. But he was a great high school ball player, Arnie, Holly, also Bill Russell, who went to IU, uh, Butch Wade, who went to Indiana State. Some very, very good high school basketball players. Those were the golden years, the 60s. Most of us have great stories to tell about our former accomplishments in athletics. Some hold true, but some are just tall tales and like a fine wine grow better with time. Here's some of those stories from the people who lived them. Well, one of the one of the stories that is always one of my favorites is, is the legend of the Bird's Eye Lantern game. And, and Bird's Eye is a small town in, in Perry, Perry County. It, it was a high school for many years and since consolidated and now part of Forest Park. And as the story goes, this took place in the mid-30s during the Depression era. So as you might imagine, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, media coverage of a regular season game at Bird's Eye during the Depression. But this, I think it's what makes the story interesting is that it's, it's kind of passed down word by word of mouth. What made this interesting was that they were playing a local rival, Marengo, and Marengo is a small little community about 25 miles apart down old Highway 64. Marengo now goes to Crawford County, give you an idea where that is. And Marengo always owned a sizable advantage in this rivalry. Birds I never had much of a program. Marengo had won a couple sectionals, and uh, when, when this game took place, it was a regular season game at Bird's Eye. Marengo typically owned a winning record, Bird's Eye did not. And this was a mid-February contest. What made this unusual was that the weather that day was not cold at all. As a matter of fact, it was unseasonably warm. And as the Marengo caravan headed to Bird's Eye, storm clouds blew up. And by the time the game actually tipped off of Bird's Eye, an all-out now thunderstorm was going on. Surprisingly, at the end of the first half, Bird's Eye has got the lead. At the end of the third quarter, Bird's Eye, the underdog, still has this lead. And at this point, the thunderstorm is going crazy outside. And lightning strikes, the lights go out. Well, Marengo, right off the bat, wants a forfeit. At this point, you know, Bird's Eye is trying to hang on to this uh, rare upset chance. So they have a meeting of the minds of the local men at center court. And lit only by the flashes of lightning from the outside windows, they come up with a plan to head home and get their kerosene lanterns and come back to, to the gym. And they scale the bleachers. There's one rafter that grows across the top of the gym. And the men of Bird's Eye, as the story goes, hang from the rafter and light the, light the game with lantern light the rest of the game. And Bird's Eye holds on for the win. Uh, literally holds on for the win. Monty Tao, uh, you know, with his father and going to the games and asking, you know, uh, there was a good player ahead of him at Oak Hill, but he was big and strong and going to Purdue, I think. But uh, Monty, as he left the gym, said, Dad, will I ever be as good as that guy? And his dad just says, if you want to be, and that was kind of, you know, spurred Monty and, and, you know, his size didn't bother him. Uh, happened at the old Lafayette Jeff Jim. We had a sports writer here in town by the name of Dick Ham who had quite a sense of humor. And uh, he always te used to tease the Lafayette Jeff Junior Varsity coach. His name was Jack Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T. And Jack Schultz was uh, one of the actors in the movie Hoosiers. He's the coach that greets Hackman, as Hackman's walking onto the floor the first time, and he says, Coach, welcome to Indiana High School Basketball. Well, 
Jack Schulhead was a long-time assistant at Lafayette Jeff, and at the old Lafayette Jeff gym, the locker rooms were downstairs. You had to run out a door, go down a flight of stairs, and the locker rooms were there. It was also the area where they let anyone who smoked go down there, because they'd open a window and let people smoke. Well, Dick Ham was a smoker, so he stood right outside the locker room and was listening to Jack Schultz yell at his team, the junior varsity team, at halftime of a game against Crawford. And Lafayette Jeff was behind by five points at halftime, and he was screaming at him. And so the kids start running out the door, and Dick Cam noticed that Jack Schultz was still in the locker room, evidently combing his hair or looking over a play or something. So Jack, Dick Cam locks the door and locks Jack Schultz in the locker room, and he can't get out. And the second half starts, and by the time he gets back up to the floor and got somebody to let him out, They'd gone from a five-point deficit to a ten-point lead, 15 to nothing run to start the second half without the coach. And when Jack came running out there, he goes, Dick Ham, why did you do that? And Dick Ham pointed to the scoreboard and said, well, they obviously do a heck of a lot better without you, Jack, because they was, they went on a 15 to nothing run while I had you locked in the locker room. My junior year, we lost. We lost 81 to 62. I remember Coach Stanley was standing there on the floor waiting. We were all waiting on the bus, and there happened to be a woman that was standing beside him, and she must have been about 75 years old from Greenfield, and she was not a happy person uh, at the time because we had lost 81 to 62. But anyhow, they, they made the, the announcement that the bus was there, and Coach Stanley turned around and ran right into this woman and almost knocked her down and raised his hands up in the air and looked at her and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, no offense. And I'll never forget, she had the, the craziest expression on her face, and she looked at, back at Coach Stanley and says, that's exactly right, Coach Stanley, and not a hell of a lot of defense either. Okay, we were playing in the uh, Huntingburg sectional, and they're just like the boys are out here getting ready to line up, and uh, a mouse run across the floor, and one of our players went out there and <laughs> stomped on that mouse and caught it by the tail and throwed it up in the crayon. We were, I forget who we were gonna play, but throwed it up in the, the uh, our opponent's crowd. You ought to have seen him scatter. <laughs> in 1965, the summer of 65, just got him playing about four hours on the outdoor court. And a, a guy pulls up and we're standing there, my coach and some downtown quarterbacks and he gets out of the car and he's yelling at my coach, Jim Rosenstiel, Hall of Famer now. He says, Rosenstiel, you're a liar, just like that. And uh, he, come o he, he comes over there and, and uh, he says, uh, and my coach says, what do you mean I'm a liar? And he says, well, you've been telling everybody in the, in the area, in Indianapolis area and around Boone County that every time Rick Mount shoots 100 jumpers, he has 80 or better at 20 feet off the dribble. He said he does. And so this guy, 1965, he this this pulls out like a wad of bill. I don't know how much money he had, but it was $100 bills. He had a bunch of them. I never seen that much money come out of somebody's pocket. So he reels off five $100 bills and says. I'll tell you right now, Mount can't do that right now. I'll just bet you $500. And $500 back then was almost what he made coaching basketball in the wintertime for Levin. So I get a get a ball, and a, one of my teammates throws it back to me, and I shot 100 jumpers off the dribble, hit 84 out of 100. And uh, this guy, you know, he's like a little puppy dog now. His tail's under his – kind of goes under his uh, – uh, between his legs. and. And uh, he goes, he walks up my my uh, coach, and he says, "Here, just, he sticks it right in his face." Says, "Here, just take the five hundred dollars like that." And my coach looked at him and says, "You take that five hundred and stick it where the sun don't shine, and get out of here." Because we already proven that I could do it. Two twins at Gersmeyer High School in Terre Haute. One was named Harley, and the other was named Arley. Harley and Arley Andrews. Now they went to state finals about two or three years in a row in the 50s. But one of the other players on the team was their uncle. So they called, and his name was Harold, and so they called him Arley, Harley, and Uncle Harold. Well, this high school coach that I told you about, Howard Sharp, he had a funny kind of thing. Being that they were twins, he had one of them wear number 34 and one wear number 43. Just the numbers backwards. 
Well, it backfired on him because at the state tournament, they got something mixed up there and they called a foul on the wrong twin and the best player fouled out of the ball game and they lost in the state high school tournament. Bill uh, Green called a meeting and he was very consoling and says, hey, you're not gonna win uh, all of them. And, and one of the things back then, we went to this school where every kid was pretty poor and uh, it was a real treat. We've got a, a, a little, little fast food place called White Castle. I'm sure everyone has heard of White Castles or sliders, if you will. And um, he says, look, I'm going to make you guys a deal. He says, I know all of you guys love White Castles, which we really, really did. He says, for every game you win next year, uh, and we played on Fridays and Saturday nights, he says, after the Saturday game, he says, I'll buy everyone White Castles uh, if we win both games on Friday and Saturday nights. Well, we took that to heart. We worked really hard during the summer, and we went 31-0, and and I think it cost the coach a few hundred dollars because we just couldn't wait to get to, uh, to, to White Castle there on Saturday nights. One of my favorite stories that, that took place, this is, I think, back in 1922, was a, a Butlerville squirrel stunt. And Butlerville is a small high school in Jennings County and never much success really, but this particular year they had what was considered really a, a monster postman at the time. He was six foot four, his name was uh, Reese Raidman, and he was about 250 pounds, big kid. And of course he played post for him. They also had a, a little guard named Merlin Swarthout who was about five foot tall and about 100 pounds. And the coach got the idea that they were gonna come up with this play where Reese would kind of bend over on his knees and Merlin's gonna crawl up his back and the lob pass comes in, they're gonna shoot from the basically too tall position. And they ran it the first time against a local rival called Scipio. Scipio just kind of went along with it, uh, just felt like they'd kind of been had and, and went along, no, no complaints, didn't, didn't complain. The very next week, sectional start, and they played um, another heated rival named Scipio. They ran it in the first quarter, scored, and Scipio was so distraught and so uh, upset about it, thinking it was an illegal play, the players and coaches alike really were so taken out of their game that uh, Butlerville kind of waltzed to a pretty easy win. The next night they had to play large school Vernon, or large school at the time Vernon for against them. And this was a classic affair. It went right down the wire. I think the score was 15 to 14 or something like that. They run the squirrel stunt. They score and win it in the, in the final seconds. At this point, the sectional officials are in touch with the IHSA because this is affecting tournament games now. Now we have to get a ruling on this. And the IHSA, without a ruling, without a rule stating it was legal or not legal, they had to let it stand. So the very next night, they played Seymour, which was the giant of their era, and Seymour rolled them. It wasn't a contest. They never got to run the play. But it's, it, that very next off season, then the IHSA made a rule against they call player assisted baskets, and and that's of course that's still in effect today. What I find really funny about this was the coach of, of Butlerville, he thought it would be unfair them to dunk the ball. He thought that would be too unfair. So in that case, he made them shoot a bank shot on the shot. Uh, we had morning practices, uh, and we bring them in at six in the morning, and uh, had a, uh, had a boy in class later that uh, that day, and he, and he kind of yawned, and we joked uh, a little bit. We said, "Boy, that six o'clock practices come early," and uh, he said, six o'clock, coach." He said, "How about 3:30?" I said, "Wow." 3.30, why so early? And he said, well, I, I had to get up and, and, and get going. I said, that early? And he said, well, yeah, coach, I, I had to walk. And I said, Ed, how, how far is it from your home? And he goes, well, it's, it's about eight miles. You know, they, they don't let me play my freshman year because there's a, there's a school ruling that says, uh, you know, because our, the ninth grade was in the junior high school at the time, uh, that they couldn't play varsity athletics. So that was okay. I just played on the freshman team and, and um, Got, you know, it was it was no issue. But what was even probably as bad as that was my sophomore year. I had to pass the ball to Billy. You know, here I've got uh, the first game I play in my sophomore year. You know, it's the end of the third quarter, and uh, I think I've got like 22 or three points, and you know, having a real nice game, bunch of rebounds, and so I'm sitting there ready to go out the second uh, or the fourth quarter, and some Scott Richards comes over backup guard and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, you're out. And I go, I'm out? What are you talking about? He goes, yeah, you're out. And I think Billy only had like 15 or 16 points at the time. And 
you know, at the end of the game, Billy had like 28 and, you know, I had like 22 and I go, hmm, you know, I think I got this thing figured out pretty well. <laughs> but don't feel sorry for him because I went back and I ran the records, okay? Even though this dude only played three games, <laughs> he only took about 20 less shots in his career than I took in four years. So he, I taught him right. I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe to an extreme. He, uh, you know, he, he figured yeah. out how to get those shots up there the next two years, that's for sure. It took me a month to get up the shots they got up in one game. You know, you're at, talking about me going to Indiana, or going to Kentucky instead of Indiana, mm -hmm. and then progressed to the ABA. Well, the, the first year that the game was tele, all-star game was televised for the ABA, and I was on the home team, the E squad, at Indiana, and when they introduced everybody, first, first game ABA ever on TV, the fans booed me. Oh, because I went to Kentucky. Most of the stories revolve around Bobby Leonard, but one time we were playing an exhibition game over at, uh, uh, at Terre Haute. We were playing at, at uh, Indiana State University, and we were playing in their new facility, and, we, and I believe we were playing against Boston. And we were at halftime of the game, and we were behind at that point. And, of course, Bobby Leonard being the, the enthusiastic coach that he was, an emotional guy that he was, um, you know, everybody came in the locker room, had a chance to go to the restroom, and had something to drink. And so we all sat around the chalkboard, and we were, we were waiting for Slick to come out. Well, Slick, Slick, Slick finally comes out, and so he starts talking to us. Well, as he starts talking to us, he gets more and more excited. Well, what we had is we had a chalkboard that was in front of him that was one of these portable one, uh, chalkboards where you could flip it over. And so Slick got, got, got going, and once he got going, he really got excited because we were behind, not playing very well. And so he, he said, you know, we're representing the ABA, and they're representing the NBA. We've got to go out and put out more of an effort. We've, got to, we've got to just got to play better. We can play much better than what we're doing. And so finally what he ended up doing is he ends up kicking – that chalkboard. Well, he kicked it down low at the bottom. Well, what happened was when he kicked that chalkboard, his foot went through between the chalkboard and the board itself. And what happened is he tried to pull his foot out. Well, his foot was stuck behind the chalkboard and the chalk railing itself, he couldn't get his foot out. He ends up Lo and behold, unknown to us because he told us all to get out. He was standing there hopping on one foot because he couldn't get the foot out. We're all we're all trying not to laugh as we're leaving the locker room. Well, he comes out late. The game had already started, and he had David Craig to, to tape up his ankle because he sprained his ankle when all of that was going on. We happened to have a home game against Mooresville, and – uh, this was the last year of the gym. We were moving into a new, a new gym at the high school on the other end of town, and everyone knew this was the last year of the gym. Well, we get a serious enough rainstorm that during the, during the JV game, the, uh, they, they can't play very much because they're, the roof is leaking so much. And I, I will, we have to actually postpone the game. And the next day in the uh, Indianapolis Star or, or News, I think it was at the time, you see a front page picture with buckets all over the court uh, 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 at Plainfield showing uh, basically the headline is, you know, got to move the game and why game rained out. So the only time I ever played, the only time I ever played in a basketball game, it was rained out and postponed due to rain in the building. Well, I like to tell that story when Billy and I got uh, 86 points in that game. That's right. You know, Dad was coaching. You know, when Billy got 70 and I got 16, it was quite a night. So, <laughs> you know, I tell people that. Uh, they go, you guys got 86 points in a game? I go, yeah, it's unbelievable. You know, Billy got 70. <laughs> you know, what's even worse than that is to get 66 points in a high school game and not have the school record. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I like to tell the story because, you know, I had like 62 or 61 or something with about three minutes left in the game. Next thing I know, there's a timeout. And some guys tap me on the shoulder saying, hey, you're out of the game. Of course, Billy's sitting behind Hey, take him out, Dad. Take him out. Take him out. No, he really didn't do that. Eddie Chicago, you know, there's some kids that come from, from poor backgrounds that, that, you know, there's a lot of uh, friction and controversy in their lives all together, whether it's in the classroom, in a community, or at home. Uh, for the two hours that you're on the court, 
that's that's when you have to have fun. That's when you know you don't want to be yelled at all the time. You know you know and things happen all the time, and you have to be lighthearted about it. I mean, we were playing in the sectional championship this year, and I was telling a kid, you know, that was going to guard their their player, their star player, that you know, I want to push him left because he he doesn't see he wants to go right all the time. So we start out the game, and he's pushing the kid right, and I started yelling. No, no, your other left, your other left. But I was listening to a game, Martinsville game on the radio, and all of a sudden the announcers just kind of lost it because a fan, Martinsville fan, came out of the stands and tackled the referee. There's a story about Onward High School in Cass County, and in 1950 they were informed that they, could, they were going to have to consolidate. And, and the people of Onward just basically refused to consolidate. And when the trustee arrived, they were, he was met by armed guards. And they s basically had centuries standing 24-hour guards. There's a great picture in Life magazine of two armed farmers with a campfire and on an all-night vigil. And as the, as the story goes, the township trustee informed the government and they sent 70 state troopers to basically take it by force, if you can imagine that. And onward, for their part, they took up the old civil defense sirens that were left over from World War II and sort of in their own militia. And they had crop dusting planes that would basically uh, run surveillance across this county road that approached the town. And when the state police came, they, they did. They sounded the alarm, literally. And the 70 police officers were met with 50 people of, of, of onward. And it was going to be this armed confrontation. And the, the high school seniors had barricaded themselves inside, chained the doors closed. And luckily, the governor intervened and, and told the officers to stand down. And they, they did retreat. And as the story goes, the, the, the people of Onward sang Onward Christian soldiers as they retreated. This is a great story. And at that point, the, the government kind of changed their tactics and said, We're, they're not going to, no longer going to try to do it by force, which had nothing but a bad ending in sight. So instead they cut their funding and basically took away their accreditation, which you would think would do it, but onward, this little town of 200 people survives as an independent high school for two years. And they basically, through chicken dinners and through chili suppers and all manners of bake sales, funded their own school. And the teachers would go sometimes partially paid and the older students would teach the classes. Ultimately though, they just ran out of money and, and they had to capitulate and they had to, to go to five miles away to the hated Walton High School. <laughs> but I think that speaks to just how important a school is to community. That these people were willing to, to, to take on all comers in order to defend the school. And one thing I, as I read about this that really I think is interesting, people in Annapolis and Lafayette and even the ro local rivals reached out to help them. Because they all, everybody felt this sense of we could be next, and they knew how important it was to them. And people would drive from Indianapolis to take part in these chicken dinners to help finance this 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 drive. While ultimately it was a, they lost in the end, and a, a diploma outside of Onward didn't mean anything, and they had to, to to give it up. I think that just speaks to how much a center of the community a school is, and to this day, maybe to a lesser extent, I still think it is. I don't think anyone's gonna. Uh, come to arms over their school anymore. But I think a lot of people still have that feeling inside. Historic Cordon, Indiana is the state's first capital and the site of Indiana's only Civil War battlefield when Morgan's Raiders came in and overtook the town. It also hosts the longest running county fair in the state of Indiana. We had a sectional my senior year that's memorable because there was a snowstorm, just like we're having right now, only a lot worse. And the teams were able to get to the sectional site before the snow got so bad that they had to close the road. So part of our fans got there, part of them didn't. And then after the game, nobody could leave. They had to spend the night, Saturday night, <laughs> most of them in the gymnasium sleeping on the bleachers. So that's, that's a year that a lot of the old timers around here remember, 1961. How did you do it, we won. We, oh, that would have been a long night if we'd have gotten beat. <laughs> Cordon High School is the home of the Panthers. Their noted alumni include Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane, actor James Best, 
Governor Frank O'Bannon, and my wife, Nora Stormin Norman McGraw. I then stopped by Holland, home of NBA stars Don Boosie and Gene Tormoyan. It's amazing this small town had two NBA stars. This also led me to Southridge in Huntingburg, Indiana. Their memorial gymnasium is one of the great sunken gyms of Indiana. This gym was built in 1972 to wrestle the sectional away from Jasper. Bob Knight took Nick Nolte here before the movie Blue Chips so he could see who's your hysteria at its best. Jasper, home of the Wildcats, is known for its heavily German, Catholic, ancestral roots. The evidence of this fact lies in the church's last name, Schnitzelbank restaurant, and the odd yet hilarious beer drinking cheer the teenage fan base spouts out at a moment's notice at any home ball game. I do want to mention an old story I read in a book called Hoosiers from Philip Hoos about the town of Jasper. I told a story about the elementary school burning the ground one year, and the small kids had to share the high school with the big kids for the rest of the school year. In sectional time, Sister Jones said that the Wildcats were going to win the state final that year. Her reasoning was that the date fell on March 19th, which is St. Joseph's Feast Day. And since their elementary was St. Joseph's School, God would reward those older students for the use of their high school. Everyone thought she was crazy and laughed at her because they were 11 and 9 in a tough sectional. They had Coach Cabby O'Neill and that was about it until a rarely used 5'6 guard Bobby White made the starting lineup. He lit it up with his driving ability. He would go to Mass every day and soon other teammates started following him. They fought their way through the tourney and eventually beat Madison 62-61. I guess through prayers, strong will, and God, all things are possible. Even a state championship with an 11-9 record. We defeated a fine Vincennes team, and we had three big wins right at the season, climax of the season. Well, we went into the tournament, and we weren't respected even then. And I think uh, we weren't the target. Uh, all those schools did like to uh, like to beat Jasper because we were had been in the Summer State a great number of times. Springs Valley made it to the championship game in 1958, but not much happened at their school after that. Oh, I forgot, Larry Bird happened. Larry Bird happened in a big way. He's become one of the all-time great players in the world of basketball. So big, in fact, he's the only person that I can get to interview for this documentary out of all the people I asked. I don't hold a grudge, mainly because he's six foot nine and can still kick my butt. I hope to actually sit down and talk with him someday. So Larry, if you're watching this, Give me a call. The Goatee has long been a very strong small school program, making it to the state in the 70s under Hall of Fame coach Jack Butcher. Butcher was a great ball player that later became the state's all-time win leader with 806. This man is a true hometown hero that turned down the Boston Celtics to come home and coach his home team. I've always heard that the Bar reeve Lagoti rivalry was something to behold and by my experience people were right. They hated each other. I think that this rivalry will last for a long, long time. I also think the fact that they are so close and both are isolated farming communities kind of contributes to this heated war on the hardwood.
Just look at this crazy fan. That was just for a free throw. Now I come to the famed Hatchet House. The Washington Hatchets have a rich tradition of basketball and a recent dominance with the Zeller family moving in. In, in Washington, it, uh, basketball is uh, very important, and I think in, in the last few years, the, the uh, success has, has been good, and, and uh, so it's, it's become even more valuable. But uh, Washington's won f uh, four state championships, 1930, 1941, 1942, and 2005. Uh, and and uh, it's very important uh, here uh, to the community. I think it, it's uh, great entertainment for the community, uh, but it's, it's something that they really take a lot of pride in, their high school basketball teams. Well, we, we go back to Steve, Steve Bushy, uh, Mr. Basketball, and we go, and uh, his teammates, uh, he had two brothers that played, Randy and Tom, and we had the Arnold boys, and uh, we, uh, well. now the, Zeller. the Zeller boys, that's undisputed what they are. Uh, Neil, uh, well, Neil, and Bushy, the older Bushy, and, um, Gosh, you know some older ones than that. Sure, I know. I knew Jim Riffey and Art Art Grove and Hook Mansion. Hook was a real hero. What about Sam and Bill G? Sam and Bill G. Um, John Fabric. Um, we're going back to the 50s. Sonny Myers. Sonny Myers. Sonny Myers. Yeah. We thought that when Bushy, Brown, and Miller played, that that was the best forward front team that we ever had. Steve Bushy's older brother, Randy, uh, beat Bedford in the regional with a uh, last second shot. Oh, it brings the crowd together. I think it brings the whole community together. And when Steve played, they really become together. Yeah, and all I can say is uh, couldn't have done it without the fans. Hometown, your neighbor, you know, friend, other players, even my players from another team, they all help. I mean, it, it, only, they only say it's only a game, but it's more than a game. Noted alumni include Chuck Harmon, the Reds' first African American player, Big Dave DeJernet, the first African American to lead an integrated team to a state title, Leo Clear, Craig Neal, Steve Bushy. Luke, Tyler, and Cody Zeller have now won seven state titles, 1930, 41, 42, 2005, 2008, 2010, and 2011. The atmosphere here is probably my favorite in the state. I do not know where the hatchets will go after the Zellers have left, but I know that this will hopefully be a special place for a long time to come. What team do you guys love to hate? Love to hate. Well, you can mention Lagodi. Love the hate hey, I you can. Love the hate I what about local teams, like local high school teams? Team. You know, like well, like Vincennes, like Vincennes. Vincennes or Vincennes. Vincennes. Well, they're called Alice's. The Alice's, that's Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me tell you, who else? Sounds sort of sissified because I'm only called the Hatchets. <laughs> <laughs> I hope no one over there is listening to this. Yeah, well, I hope not too because I got a lot of friends over there. The Anderson fans had taunted us all afternoon long between games uh, about the Watson Alice. We take a lot of ribbing over a nickname, you know, so that night when we sat down for a pre-game meal, you know, I said, these people keep wanting to know what an Alice is, you know. I said, tonight an Alice can be anything it wants to be, and it's going to be the team that kicks those Indians rear ends. Vincent still leading 40 to 38, though, with six minutes and 45 seconds to play. Alice's have suddenly had their scoring cut off in the second half until suddenly Tim Feet bangs one hole. High posting is Whitty, the give and go to Cook. Nice move inside. Andre Morgan gets the big one. 51 to 46. One minute, 20 seconds to play. Taken away. Defensive play down along that baseline by Tim Feet. Out it comes to Doug Cook. Cook, good ball handler. Three on one advantage on the break. Yeah. He got the field goal. Doug Cook gets a big one. He has 25 points. And they begin to celebrate in the Vincent cheering section. 
Henrik Lewis wings inside and got the fielder. Andre Morgan to David Moore. The layup is good. Moore has his ninth point. We're down to one second, and it's all over. I finally made my way down to Evansville, which is a large river city with a pretty good sports background. Evansville is the third largest city in Indiana, but it doesn't feel large, mainly because it has 13 neighborhoods that qualify for the National Register of Historic Places. The city has museums, zoos, universities, and of course sports teams, including semi-pro teams in hockey, baseball, soccer, and football. Bossy Field is also the field used in the movie A League of Their Own. Teams from Evansville have won state many times, with Evansville Bossy having the most with three championships. Noted alumnus from this area are Calvert Chaney from Harrison, Aaron McCutcheon from Bossy, Lee Hamilton from Central, Andy Bennis, a baseball player from Central, Kyle Keurig from Wrights Memorial, Don Mattingly, another baseball player from Wrights Memorial, Larry Stallings, an NFL player from Wrights, Dave Shawhouse from North, Bob Ford from North, Bob Greasy, a football player from North, Terry Dissinger from North, the list goes on and on. We won the state championship in 44. We really wasn't supposed to win it that year, and we, we did. And, of course, after we won that, why, we came back the next year and, uh, and won it again. In southeastern Indiana, my home stomping grounds. Going to this Providence Pioneers versus New Albany Bulldog rival game was a great eye-opener. It was somewhat of a large school, small school matchup, but not in the traditional sense. The difference is that the small school feels like a large school because it's a private school in a large metropolitan area. Providence had similar rabid fans, similar cheers, but not quite a similar game. Bulldogs easily dominated them in the end. The Scottsburg Warriors have a really awesome rivalry between them and the Austin Eagles. Scottsburg's had more success in their girls programs than the boys, but the boys do have two all-stars, Vern Altmaier and Bill James. They've also had Hall of Fame coach Jim Barley. Austin's had three all-stars, Mark Lukin, Anthony Winchester, and Jeremy Holland along with two Hall of Fame coaches, Ray Green and Jim Hamill. This rivalry has been violent at times, but it's always been the highlight of both schedules. I lived four miles from Austin and know how rough they can be at times. Pistol City and LA neighborhoods ring a bell. Seymour has one of the biggest gyms in the state. It seems absolutely cavernous when it's empty. But when Jennings County or sectional or regional time rolls around, it's a different story.
This knife showed the two schools truly do hate each other. The Panthers have the most original rowdy fans this night, but the Owls get props for having the most gutsy fan, evidenced by tearing up the Panthers' practical joke of a sideline banner. I watched Damon Bailey play here in the sectionals and regionals back in the day, and that atmosphere was electric. <laughs> Brownstown's had good teams in almost any sport for as long as I can remember. I went to Crothersville and they beat us bad every single year, usually probably with their JV team. This Brownstown-Salem rivalry has always been good, especially now that they both have great coaches. Brownstown coach Dave Benner was not only a great player, but is now one of Southern Indiana's best coaches around. The Salem versus Orleans big school, small school matchup has been especially good in recent years. Lions have had Jimmy Apple in the 80s and was the home of Coach Everett Dean. Friday night Paoli game is always a good time. The only problem is it almost blinds you it's so bright. It almost looks like an Easter egg. The Jeffersonville Red Devils New Albany Bulldogs robbery has been my favorite rivalry of all time. This robbery's gotten so bad in the past, it's had fist fights, it's had fixed games. Probably some referee payoffs. I like seeing this game in Jeffersonville more than New Albany because honestly their gym's a lot cooler. Either way, it's always a great time. 1990 through 1995, the regional championship game was Jeffersonville, New Albany. And it was amazing the uh, excitement an hour before that game. Now, the game during the regular season was important, but the game at the end of the season. You know, that meant going to Simmons State. And in those five games, I coached against a gentleman named Jim Miller, who's now in the Hall of Fame, who I considered a friend. And in those four, in those five games, we were fortunate enough to win four of them. But whether we won or whether we lost, uh, Jim and I, after the game, it was just good sportsmanship. And so you fought like crazy because people lived so close to each other. The players knew each other. But when it was over, it was a uh, respect. Like, I know the year that they beat us in 94 and went to the uh, state finals, you know, I was proud that they went. And I think Coach Miller and New Albany, if we beat them, they were hoping that we would win the state when we went on up there. And I never realized how much the people of Jeffersonville wanted to win the state championship until we won. 
And for some of them, that was a lifelong goal that they had lived there for, had season tickets for 50, 60 years. And basketball is such a source of pride in Jeffersonville. And just to see the smiles on the people's face, um, nothing will ever take that away. In white, John Adams in red. New Albany with the ball. Norman puts it up and scores. Webb, 15-footer, good. Mukes from outside, good. Webb. Hits again. Norman puts up the left-hander and makes it. It's up. No good. Pulled out of there by Norman for New Albany. Gives to Slaughter. Slaughter shot. Good. Norman makes two free throws, 84-77, that ices it. Both coaches have emptied their benches now and brought in the subs. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an intense, it's an intense game when Jeffersonville and, and uh, New Albany are playing because usually you have some great uh, basketball players in that area, so they're very competitive. And, uh, and both schools like to win, it's a traditional thing to uh, beat each other, it's been a tradition for years, so so, so we're, we're really out to get one another. I think the, uh, the fact that they're having this uh, event today shows the, the fan support and how the uh, fans here in Indiana love Indiana basketball. And uh, it's done like it. <laughs> Jeffersonville finally won a title in 1992, so that gives one title each to both towns, even playing field again. Batesville Bulldogs boast one of the loudest and best cheer blocks in the state. Also like seeing the Ripley County Tournament here. It's usually every team against Batesville, and that's probably the way Batesville likes it. To me, high school basketball came alive here in Indiana when God said, let there be Milan. And uh, that's what Indiana high school is all about. It's about uh, sometimes uh, uh, Goliath getting slayed by one of these small schools, whether that be in a sectional or a regional. Milan 
Myelin did some things like holding the ball and not shooting that hadn't been seen before. The Myelin miracle has propelled the Hoosier legend for 50 plus years now. It's fueled the debate for class basketball ever since. The only tragic side is that every young player in that town has to hear and live out that legacy for as long as they can remember. It's inescapable, but they will someday appreciate how rare and special that one event really was in our state's basketball history. Previous year, we had gone to the Final Four and we had a number of players returning. So uh, we slipped up on people in 1953. Everyone knew that we were around beginning the 1954 season. With, I don't know, five, six seconds to go, I faked left and it was the first time that Jimmy Barnes just moved a little bit and he leaned on his right foot and I went around to the right side and actually I was wide open right at the edge of the free throw lane and luckily the ball went in. Bobby Plump holds the ball and I believe we're going to have, we'll probably have a timeout here in a minute. We're down to three minutes and 40 seconds. Three minutes and 39 seconds. We're getting another boy ready to come into the ball game. And we'll see what's going to be. Wendelman's coming in in a moment. A timeout. Kraft holds the ball over to White. Then back to Kraft, who fakes, jumps to the high circle, scores. Scores by 28 to 28 and gives it to Ray Kraft. Kraft goes down in, under, shoots, and misses with a shooter now. A minute left in the ball game, 30 to 28. Has the ball going to Muncie. Muncie has the ball over on the side to Hines. Hines holds the ball in the corner. And it's broken up, but received by Barnes. Start off, Lars, just destroys. Four ties. He's dribbling around 10 seconds, 9 seconds. Bobby Plump dribbling 6 seconds. Plump going down. Jump, shoots from the circle. Scores! Before we went up on the court to play Muncie Central, we had a motorcycle policeman back then that they turn on their sirens and we get to run all the red lights from our hotel to Butler Fieldhouse. We didn't have any red lights in Milan, so that's a pretty big deal. He told us before we went, Pat Stark was his name, he just died two years ago. He said, if you guys win, he said, I'll take you downtown around the circle backwards. Now, Chris Volts from Milan had supplied us Oldsmobiles for the regionals, Buicks for the semifinals, and Cadillacs for the state tournament. So we're going around the circle backward. In our Cadillacs, we stayed in Indianapolis that night. The next day, we drove to Milan that Sunday. Shelbyville, the team that we had defeated 43 to 21 the year before, they met us at the outskirts of town with their police cars and fire trucks, turned on the sirens, took us through town in a parade. Greensburg took us through town. We get to Penn Town, which is about 11 miles from Milan. There, there's an 18 mile long caravan behind us. Cars are parked along the side of the road and people are walking. They had state police in Milan. And Milan was a community of about 11 or 1200 then. The state police estimated between 30 and 40,000 people were in Milan to greet us. And now the subject of the motion picture, Hoosiers. Many rate it the greatest sports major film of all time. It was a salute, a deep salute, to the power of high school basketball in the state of Indiana. I'm such a huge fan of the movie that I even went to New Richmond to reenact the scene of Coach Dell coming into town. Too bad it was winter instead of fall. That would have been great.
Historic Madison, Indiana lies on the banks of the Ohio River just northeast of Louisville. This is a town that seems to be from another time. Even the Cubs' old school rivalry with the two local teams, the Madison Shaw Hilltoppers and the Southwestern Rebels, seems like it's from another time. The Rebels-Cubs game is the biggest game of the year and always sells out. Winning this game gives the schools bragging rights and typically makes their entire season. I teach at Southwestern, so I've become immersed in this rivalry due to the fact that I have three girls playing at Southwestern. By the way, this call was the gutsiest call I've ever seen since I've been watching basketball. But it was the right call. <laughs> Finally, I went to see my home team, the Crothersville Tigers! There's nothing to do in the town on a Friday night, so the games are usually packed in this small gym. I'd like to think that we're rivals of Austin and Brownstown, but we usually get drummed by them. Medora is the more likely scenario, even though we usually beat them up pretty bad. We've never won a sectional in any sport. And when we finally do, I think it'll be the greatest moment in sports history, at least at Crothersville. Hopefully it comes in basketball. Final thoughts. Well, I mean, I don't know how much tape you have. It'd be hard to go on. I mean, it wouldn't be hard at all to use the rest of the tape talking about what basketball means and, and what you can learn from the game. And that's what's so great about it because there's so many things that carry over into real life. Life's lessons uh, are, are started at a very young age. And if you can get the basics of those down, uh, later on, they're going to come very valuable to you. I think any extracurricular activity is, is healthy for uh, young individuals today. They could be doing a lot worse things and uh, I just think that if, if they participate in the extracurricular activity that they're going to find the avenue they really like and if they, if they fall in love with it and have the passion for it, they're going to put the time in to, to become successful. Uh, but I think sports in general um, are, are very good for kids. I think it teaches them a lot um, as far as the dedication that it takes to be successful, you know, because to be a good uh, basketball player, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time and it, and it takes a lot of hard work. Uh. I think you learn leadership through athletics. You know, being a leader, not only being able to lead others, but you have to lead yourself. You have to set a good example, you know, not only for an example for yourself, but you have to set an example for others. When you are an athlete, 
there are a lot of people watching you. You may or you may not want to be a role model, but if you're in athletics, you're going to be a role model whether you like it or not. When you're a little person, you look up and see other big guys doing something, and you want to do that. So as a big person myself, you realize there are little people watching you, so you want to make a, set a good example. So, Well, first of all, I would stress the fact they must have patience. It could take time and should, and there's going to be ups and downs and peaks and valleys. You know, life itself, uh, and, and, and in every area, you're, you're going to have, there are going to be peaks and valleys. They're going to be, everything is not going to be rosy, and everything is not going to be down. There are going to be peaks and valleys, but it's up to the individual uh, to not permit the peaks to, get, peaks to get too high or the valleys too low. Uh, and they must have patience. I would stress that very much. And remembering that whatever they're doing, uh, they must prepare for a failure to prepare is preparing for fail. Those are the important things. That, uh, yeah, regardless of how you feel in any occupation or profession or anything you're doing, be always considerate of others. Those are the things that I would uh, probably uh, uh, stress to them. Uh, Somebody once said, uh, you got to have a passion. If you want to succeed in something, you got to have a passion for it. And, and I think in, that's true in sports. You've got to have a passion. You've got to really be to sacrifice. You've got to have good work ethics. And uh, you've got to persevere. And... I think parents make a, make a big mistake when they try to push them too hard because these kids are either going to have a passion for it or they're not. And you can't, you can't put passion into somebody to play basketball or football or study or there's got to be something in there where they've got to have a passion themselves you're not going to make them do it so branch mccracken used to tell us that he would rather have a kid come to indiana who was cocky because he could take it out of him but he can't put it into him it also teach you that uh, winning gracefully losing gracefully respecting your opponent and of course a big factor in that is teamwork, you know. I don't care what you do in life, usually there's gonna be a team around you and you're gonna be part of a team. And it's about being on a team. It's about, it's about being a part of something that's greater than what you are. It's about being something that matters. It's about being something that, that unifies people for a common goal. Um, and I, I think more than anything, how you deal with other people, how you deal with other people's feelings, how you deal on a day-to-day -day basis with, with good things and bad things, and how you have to give up your ego and be a part of a team. I think that's the life lesson. And, and clearly, I think in, in our state, it also it means how you handle losses. Because there's only gonna be, you know, it used to be only one team, now there are four teams that's gonna win. It's how you handle that. And I think everybody, everyone would agree that uh, you learn those things out on the court. You learn those things not necessarily with your teammates, but when you're when you're out to trying to work on your individual game. And the, you can't replace life lessons like that. There, I don't think there are uh, too many other avenues to learn those kinds of lessons in our culture. I just don't see them. And I think more than anything, you learn the lessons, but you also develop the bond with people. You know, they'll always be your teammates. They'll always be your coaches. You're, you're going to get out of it what you put into it, and uh, if you're going to be successful, it's, it's no different than anything else. You got you got to work hard, and uh, you, you know it, it's just a thing that uh, fundamentals I think is very important. Uh, a lot of kids have a lot of talent, but if they don't work hard and they and they don't work on the fundamentals, uh, it, it, it's going to pass you by. I mean, there'll be kids that do that, and uh, they'll move ahead of you. But you got to get find two or three hours a day to go out there and work on your fundamentals and get yourself better because just playing games isn't going to make you uh, better fundamentally. You got to you got to work on your own. Be a good person in your community. Don't get in any trouble. Leave drugs in the back alone, and uh, and have fun. I mean basketball. You know it it opens a lot of doors. I mean it gives people an opportunity, and the young people need to understand that um, don't let basketball use you. I mean, because let's keep things in perspective, it's just a game. It's something that you can't do forever. Uh, I, I think if you turn it around, if, you, if, if you're excited about playing basketball and you use basketball to open doors, hey, you can get a free education. I mean, it, it opened the door for me to attend the University of Kentucky. And, you know, I met my, fam my wife. You know, I have a wonderful family now through basketball. If you look at life as like a, a quilt, uh, you know, the, the thread that run through that, the common thread that runs through that quilt was basketball. I mean, 
you know, mothers, fathers, generations. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was tradition. It was history. Uh, like I said, it was just it was a it was woven in as a part of the fabric of life, and it touched you know almost everyone. Uh, Where basketball is a life, um, people talk it, people know it. Um, one of the neat things about Indiana is that the, the fans here know basketball. Uh, just playing basketball every day, it helps me relieve stress. Uh, anytime I got a problem or something, I come to the gym and. I'm always happier when I leave, so uh, that's probably the way it's affected me. And then it just gives me something to do instead of to go out and party or uh, do the wrong kind of thing. So uh, it's it's a great thing for me. Keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, obviously you learn discipline. Uh, you learn how to get along with people. Uh, you learn how to win. You learn how to lose. Uh, I think it's just a good experience. I know. I always uh, try to get young people to get involved in some athletic uh, endeavor. I think that it uh, helps them mature, it helps them get out of their self a little bit and see the world as a little bigger place. It, it almost, it, it almost uh, makes a name, makes Indiana a basketball name. Yes. I have relatives that live in Florida and uh, they don't even know how to play basketball down there. <laughs> Basketball's really been influential in my entire life. Uh, I, I think we really need to try to get it back to where it used to be, you know. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try to help do with the younger guys, you know, help mentoring them as far as, you know, uh, with basketball, but not just so much on the court, but as well as off the court. In Indiana, when I grew up, of course, it was the thing to do if you were an Indiana kid. You always wanted to be a basketball player for your local high school team. And I think here in southeastern Indiana, basketball is still quite a rivalry. And they start them out when they're just barely young enough to dribble a ball. And so they just develop into basketball players. When you mention Hoosiers, you just think of Indiana basketball. Uh, we have something unique here in Indiana. And I hope we all, as Hoosiers, and anyone else who will be listening to this video, will appreciate it. Uh, it's a way of life here. Uh, it's something that, real, that is real special. I think uh, uh, everyone around the country understands that about, about our state. But uh, I just uh, have been privileged to not only play the game, uh, but been able to start it right here in Indiana and be coached by people who not only care about the game but care so much about the kids that they co that they coach. What a tremendous honor and, and a blessing it has been. Uh, these these uh, venues, as you look throughout the entire state, uh, has been a, a tremendous blessing to to all those who participate in the game of basketball here in the state of Indiana. And I would just like to to encourage those of you all who are who are looking at this uh, uh, this documentary, this video, to uh, to keep in mind where basketball has come from here in the state of Indiana, where it is today, and where it's going to. It's all about the kids, both boys and girls. And uh... yeah, I had a great lesson by a dad one time when I was very very young. I was fortunate enough to to go with a, a bunch of men to high school games. My dad, some of his friends, they included me, and we had this tradition of going out afterwards to coffee and. As, as, a, as a young boy of eight or nine, maybe, I remember drinking coffee and thinking how great that was and talking to all these teams. And I grew up near Evansville, so the power teams at the time were, were, were Bossy and, and Vincennes, and even, even Tiny Logoti was considered very good. And we'd talk about them, and somebody brought up a team about New Harmony. And I remember, I never said much, but I laughed out loud. I said, why, why are we talking about New Harmony? They're, they're terrible. And my dad looked me in the eye and said, in Indiana, every team is somebody's favorite team and every team is worth talking about. And the same can be said for players. And through my, my website, I've always felt the same way. Every team has a story, and every campaign is the most important season to somebody's family. And while there's great success or, or maybe a one-win season, that campaign attaches them to this great thing of Indiana basketball. And, and that's what we all have in common. Whether, whether it's a supporting a, a poor program or one that's a perennial con state contender, that's what makes us special, is this, this connection. And even with class basketball, it's still there. It's still there.
I originally started doing this video to kind of get closer to my family and at the same time do something I love. I also wanted to relive those fun times of going to games when I was younger with my dad. I think I achieved both those goals. During the 2009 season, my father contracted cancer. He briefly got better over the next year and a half after treatment, but in 2011, things took a turn for the worse. He missed the entire basketball season as well as my old, oldest daughter's entire sophomore season of volleyball. He wanted to see his grandkids play more than anything. I finally talked him to go into the National AAU Volleyball Tournament in Orlando, Florida in 2011. He said it was one of the greatest vacations and best times watching sports he's ever had in his life. This is dedicated to all the fans, players, coaches, coaches' wives, and anyone who's loved watching high school basketball. It's also dedicated to Paul Fisher and his wonderful family. Buddy, you'll truly be missed. On a personal note, I'd especially like to dedicate this to my wife Nora and my daughters Lexi, Kaya, and Hayden. Most importantly, this is dedicated to my dad, Vernon Leslie Means, whom I will truly miss. Thank God for allowing me to connect with you once again through basketball. Thanks for watching Indiana's Obsession. From its humble beginnings and the explosion of interest during its golden age, right up to its current incarnation of the multi-class system, basketball has and always will be Indiana's Obsession. In the last story, uh, one of the neat stories, I had a chance to, you know, be able to sit with some great uh, Indiana high school basketball all-stars, uh, Harley and Arley um, from, from, from Terre Haute, who were all-stars. They were uh, brothers and twins, and Bobby Plump, myself, uh, Bob Leonard, Bill Green, and uh, uh, Joe Sexton from Tech High School, who probably might be the, one of the best all-around athletes who, who ever played here in Indiana. And uh, we had a few beers, and you know, this has been a few years ago. And Bobby Plump is all he's talking about is the shot he made, and you know, they made the movie Hoosiers, and this and that about that team. Well, it was a much better team than people gave it credit for, because they actually beat Oscar Robinson's. Uh, in the 1954-55 semifinal game 
and to go on to play Muncie Central in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the state championship, which they won. But um, Bob Leonard, who was our coach with the Pacers, uh, never wants to give anybody credit, so he always needles guys. And, of course, Plump's going on and on about uh, Milan and his team and who played and about that game and about the shot. And finally, Bobby Leonard tells, uh, tells him, he says, uh, you know, Bobby, he says, just you made one shot and you'd become a multimillionaire from it. He says, just think, if that shot would have lipped out, you'd have been pumping gas still in Pierceville. <laughs> <laughs>